microphone like this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, when Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Planning Committee. If the fire alarm is activated, please vacate the offices via the stairs, either the security door over here or opposite the lifts in the foyer. Please do not use the lifts. Please assemble in Hawley Square on the green. Officers will assist you and advise you when it is deemed safe to return to the chamber. Does anyone intend to film the meeting? No? Thank you. Would everyone present please ensure their mobile phones are turned to silent and that they are not used to make or receive calls in the chamber whilst this meeting is in progress? Uh, would any member who wishes to speak under Council Procedure Rule 20.1 please announce it now? Before you do, I have already for item 4A, Councillors Smith and Pugh, item 4M, Councillor Pressland, Item 4L, Councillor Pugh, and Item 5, Councillor Pugh. Are there any others? Thank you. The following... Is that right? Next? I haven't got it up out of order, have I? Okay. The following application has been reserved for public speaking. Item 4A, land on the west side of Tothill Street, Ramsgate. Item 4B, Reclamet Recycling Centre, Woodchurch Road, Birchington. Item 4C, Plot 6, land adjacent to Clifftop, North Foreland Avenue, Broadstairs. Item 4D, 32 Crow Hill, Broadstairs. Item 4L, land north of Down Barton Road, St Nicholas at Wade. And item 4M, 16 Soul Street, Broadstairs. I have apologies from Councillor Dennis with no substitute. Do I have any other apologies? Thank you. Um, are there any declarations of interest? Thank you, Councillor Rizeki. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, as, as uh, explained at the beginning, uh, item 4D, I'd like to recluse myself on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Do members agree that the minutes of the planning committee meeting held on the 19th of April 2023 be approved as a correct record? Do I have a proposal for that? Councillor Alban. And a seconder? Councillor Bayford. Thank you. Um, any site visits will take place for committee members on the 7th of July 2023. The planning applications manager will now outline a point of information regarding the applications at 54 Stone Road Broadstairs Item 4A, land on the west side of Tothill Street, Minster, and item 4M, 16 Soul Street, Broadstairs. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, point of information about 54 Stone Road, Broadstairs, um, which was voted on at the April Planning Committee meeting for a site visit. So, this application has been appealed by the applicant for non-determination of the application by the Council, with the application now being determined by the Planning Inspectorate. Uh, we'll update members when we receive the start date of the appeal, um, but therefore no site visit will occur by the planning committee on the application. 
point of information on item 4A, land on the west side of Tothill Street. Uh, subsequent to the publishing of the agenda, the council has received further clarification on the works to the bridleway following a meeting and agreement between the parish council, KCC's public rights of way officer and the applicant. And this will be outlined in the presentation by the principal planning officer. And the last update for item 4M, which is 16 Soul Street Broadstairs, we've received confirmation that the contribution to the strategic access management and monitoring plan for the development of the site has been paid, and therefore there's no reason to defer the application back to officers uh, for approval subject to either getting that payment or a new legal agreement, and therefore the recommendation to members is updated for the development to be approved subject to the safeguarding conditions in the committee report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, moving on to item agenda 4A, land on the west side of Tothill Street, Ramsgate. Um, beginning with speaking in favour of the application is Ms Amy Taplin, Templin, and I'll remind you that you have three minutes. Thank you. Chairman, members of the committee, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Amy Templin and I represent the applicant, David Wilson Holmes. I'd like to thank the planning officer for their extensive report and recommendation for approval. I will not repeat the details of the report, rather reiterate and respond to some of the key points. As you are aware, the site is one that already benefits from outline planning permission. The application before you this evening considers the detailed layout, scale, appearance and landscaping of Phase 1, providing 133 residential dwellings. This development has been designed to comply with the parameters set out within the outline, ensuring the development is sensitive to the context, in particular the surrounding residents and landscape. The spine road has speed reduction features, utilising the site access approved and discussed at the outline stage, and many of the internal streets have been designed as shared services to create a safe environment for all users. Concerns were raised by both councillors and the planning officer regarding the levels and the relationship between the proposed development and the existing properties on Fairfield Road. We work proactively with the planning officer to reduce the ground levels in this area and provide additional boundary treatments to enhance the privacy for both existing and new residents. Another main concern from residents was the Bridalway Enhancement Works. I attended a meeting on behalf of David Wilson last week along with the public right-of-way officers and parish councillors and discussed the preferred approach. Additional surveys are now underway and discussions will be ongoing with KCC Public Right of Way to ensure the character and history of the bridleway is retained. Initial concerns were raised by councillors and the housing officer in regard to the affordable housing mix. However, I can confirm that the proposal is policy compliant and following discussions with both the planning and housing officer, additional one-bed apartments have been added and confirmation has been sought that the current mix addresses local needs. There are a range of high quality materials and elevational enhancements such as bay windows on those dwellings that front Tothill Street, which are in keeping with the surrounding village. All dwellings are supported by private and communal electric charging points, promoting sustainability. The design also includes substantial areas of open space, offering a variety of formal and informal open space with pedestrian links to the bridleway, as well as an equipped play area, incorporating a range of ecological enhancements and sustainable drainage features across the site. Throughout the planning process, we work proactively with officers, responding to queries raised and would ask members to note that there are no objections from KCC Highways, the Environment Agency, KCC Drainage, nor indeed any of Thanet's own officers. Overall, the application provides much needed homes within a sustainable location within the district and I would urge members to support the officer's recommendation in granting approval this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaking under Council Rule 20.1, first is Councillor Abby Smith. Three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And um, thank you very much, Ms. Taplin. It's really helpful to, and encouraging to hear what you had to say. I am here um, purely because uh, Minster Parish Council is unable to attend this evening. Um, and I just want to reiterate what has been said to me and what has become very clear both from the uh, um, parish council itself and from um, residents who have attended parish council that it is very important that the character and history of the uh, bridal way is retained and that the hedgerow in particular is retained. Um, and I wasn't a hundred percent. And I have read and reread the correspondence on this, and I'm really not hundred percent certain that, that that's 
uh, guaranteed, but I'd just like the planning committee to be aware that that's an important factor. And with that, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Pugh. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to reiterate much of what uh, Councillor Smith has said. Um, I'm very relieved to hear that the applicant has taken on board uh, the views of uh, Minster Parish Council and of the Council and of the ward councillors, uh, particularly in their concerns about the, uh, the heights of some of the buildings back in onto Fairfield Road. I think that's really encouraging that changes have been made. Um, I'm also very glad to hear that changes will be made or not to uh, the bridle path and that it won't be filled in. I think it's really important that, you know, particularly uh, local geological kind of heritage within the villages is, is respected and maintained as much as possible. Um, so if all of that has been agreed, um, then I'm, I'm happy for this application to be approved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll now ask the Principal Planning Officer to outline the report. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> this is the application site here outlined in uh, red. So Tothill Street is on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, the bridal uh, way being referred to is along the western boundary of this slide. Um, to the north, you can see the um, cemetery, and the area in the blue line is um, the area that formed the um, expansion area for the cemetery through the outline application. So this is an aerial view of the site. So you can see Tothill Street again on the right-hand side with the cemetery um, to the north of the slide. Um, the bridal way runs along in this location here, and the application site um, extends along these boundaries. Um, so this application is a, um, for phase one of, of the development, so it's only in um, this location here for the actual development itself. This is just a more detailed aerial view showing Tothill Street. So you can see the cemetery on the right-hand side um, with Tothill Street um, at the bottom of this slide, so it's just reorientated slightly. Um, and just so you can see the existing neighbouring properties in the area uh, along Fairfield Road and again to the, um, to, to the other side of Tothill Street. So these are some photos um, going around the site. So this is taken, um, sorry, going back here. This, we're in this top um, corner here, and we're going to walk down the bridleway with these photos. So um, we're by the A299. Um, the application site is in the distance here, and this is the bridleway um, running to the site. So and this is another view with the application site here. Again, the bridleway on this right-hand side here. So walking down the um, bridleway, you can see existing um, agricultural fields either side. So these aren't part of the application. It's beyond this fenced area here. And this is now the application site. So you can see some um, work has taken place, mainly to have archaeology and um, some uh, other exploration work within the site. Um, again, you can see the bridleway along here and the um, fencing around the site. So from visiting the site, uh, KCC have advised that the actual um, bridleway is on the boundary of the site. So the actual boundary of the application site is actually in this location here where the um, bridleway exists, but it's been set, the fence has been set further away from the bridleway just to give a bit of protection and, and continued use of the bridleway. So again, views into the site here. I'm um, oh, sorry, going the wrong way. Um, and here again, so you can see there's quite a lot of existing vegetation adjacent to the boundary, and this is the concern that's been um, raised from residents that through the original plans, it was intended to remove quite a lot of this because the proposal was to, to widen the bridleway. So going down here again, you can see existing um, trees. There's no mature trees along here, but quite a lot of uh, growth. So when you get to this point here, the actual bridleway is um, actually to the left here. So this is an area that's now been used by people, so it's an informal path but the actual bridleway runs through the centre of this vegetation and is quite overgrown so it's quite difficult for, for it to have been used. Um, so again you can see here so this on the left hand side is the existing bridleway this is the area on the right hand side that has actually been used as a path because of the fact this is quite overgrown. Um, so KCC have confirmed that this would be added um, to every year to their um, clearance program so they would be looking to come out and actually clear this to make this usable. And again, further down, heading down the site. And again, the bridleway is on the left-hand side here. And then we get towards the bottom of the site, coming out now, um, close to Prospect Road. So then this is looking back, um, so back towards Prospect Road. And then again, of the actual application site itself, so looking over to the properties in Greenhill Gardens. And then again, just looking back up north of the site, 
and now we're in Prospect Road with the bridleway in this location here and this the application site on the right hand side. And then this is just the view again with um, the application site here and the bridleway off to the left hand side. So now moving around the site, we're just going to go along um, Green Hill Gardens, so the bottom of this point here, and come up Green Hill, Gar Green Hill Gardens and round Prospect Road. So um, this is taken on uh, the corner looking with Prospect. Prospect, uh, sorry, Green Hill Gardens on the right-hand side, and this is the another existing path on the left-hand side, and this is the application site in front of us. And now we're heading up um, Green Hill Gardens. So through the um, approved outline application, there's an emergency access, vehicular access point in this location here. And then heading up the road, so you can see um, Green Hill Gardens consists mainly of bungalows and chalet-style bungalows. And then as we come into um, Fairfield Road, you can see there's more of a mix of dwelling types. So you've got bungalows and then it um, turns into two-storey dwellings towards the end of Fairfield Road. And now just coming up of Fairfield Road into Top Hill Street. So we're in this location here. These are the properties in Fairfield, uh, sorry, in Top Hill Street on the corner with Fairfield Road. So you can see there's a um, mix of tem uh, terrace and semi-detached properties, mainly brick, but render. And you can see there's quite a few bay um, features on the properties and then again just a, a, a longer view of the site so the application site is now is on the left hand side here just beyond these properties and now this is the application site in this location here and now this is just showing the the nearest neighboring property on Tot Hill Street and you can just see um, the ground level changes so there's a small retaining wall along this property with the ground level within the application site higher um, than the neighbors and you could see from that previous slide as well that the ground level changes from um, from Fairfield Road in this location here up to the application site so there's a, a big ground level change and then this is now just going up the site with the application site again on the left and then just looking back down the site with the application on the right just showing the variety of um, building styles and properties in the area and then just a further view again of the application site so the access into the site would be on the right hand side here and the proposal is looking to retain hedgerow along um, this front boundary. And then a further view again. So just to uh, quickly show members the outline approval. So this was the outline parameter plan that was approved. Um, the the um, access was approved as part of this application. It was approved for 214 dwellings. Um, the access was approved in this location here so th what this plan is, is is just showing the um, parameters that were approved through the outline so the area in yellow is the area that um, can be no long no more than 1.5 stories in height and this was because of the proximity of the bungalows in green hill gardens and the limited um, depth of their gardens it was felt necessary to reduce the um, or restrict the height of development in that location and then the area in red you can see the long strip here in the two um, circles here these are the areas that are archaeological exclusion zones. So during the application, um, the work um, that was carried out found that these areas were so significant they can't be developed upon. So these areas are excluded from development other than the access road, which um, has been allowed to be extended across this point here. So also approved through that application was the actual access, vehicular access into the site. So this shows the vehicular access. So through this application, there have been some um, concerns raised by residents regarding the access and the fact there's no central island um, to the centre of the access. So we did seek the views from KCC. Obviously, the access has already been approved, so we couldn't change that anyway, but just to seek their advice on it. And they advised that the um, width of the access is, is uh, similar to other accesses without... Um, pedestrian islands being um, being visible and also if there was to be a, a pedestrian island in the centre it would restrict um, the movement of larger vehicles into the site so it would actually cause more problems um, and the safety order that was carried out at the time found that to be fine so that is that is the approved access and then just so you're aware because I know other concerns that were raised were to do with the impact on highway um, from Top Hill Street being such a busy road and um, additional vi uh, vehicles being added to the street. But through that application, just so you you know, the mitigation that was approved was through um, the widening of the access leading onto the roundabout. So this is Top Hill Street and this is the application site in this location here. And the mitigation secured um, the widening of this to create an additional lane which would help to reduce um, uh, traffic queues along Top Hill Street. And the mitigation also secured um, money towards the improvements to a Spitfire Way junction as well. 
So this application is a reserve matters application. Um, all we're looking at is the layout and the scale and design of the development as, long, as well as the landscaping. So um, you can see this is the overall um, layout that's been proposed. So this is a phase one of the development, which is um, towards the north of the site. So the area in grey is not being considered as part of this application and will come forward as part of a future phase. Um, you can see the existing access in this location here and then areas of uh, landscaping around the edge of the site and to the south of the site. So this application is for 133 dwellings. Um, it's for a mix of uh, unit sizes and types. All of them meet the space standards. They're all two-storey in height. They all are provided with doorstep play space. Um, this plan shows the mix of the unit sizes. So there's a mix of the one, two, three, and four bed across the site. Um, concern was raised with the lack of one bed units, especially for the affordable provision, and that's been increased from two units up to six units, which housing have um, agreed with. So the affordable units are located in the centre here, so they're the pink units towards the centre. So it did achieve 30% affordable on the site, so this application proposes 40 affordable units. In terms of open space provision, this plan just shows um, the open space being provided across the site. So um, you can see the area in pink um, in this location here around the edge of the site is the area that's um, semi-natural open space. And then light green um, in this location here and here and to the top here, these areas are um, the amenity space. And then to the bottom, there would be a community orchard. And then in the center here, the purple, and within the future phase as an equipped play area. And a detailed plan for the equipped play area has been um, submitted through this application, so showing a range of equipment within the centre of the site. Um, so this is uh, well accessible from uh, Tothill Street and would also be accessible through to the Bridalway as well, so it could be potentially accessed by the existing community as well as residents of the site itself. The open space significantly exceeds the minimum requirements set out within um, policy GI05. This is mainly because of the um, large areas of the archaeological exclusion zones, which do limit the um, amount of development on the site. So there's very large areas of open space all to the south of the site. In terms of the um, layout of the houses, the, they all have street frontage. So you can see on the right-hand side, the properties front onto Tot Hill Street. Um, they follow um, the linear pattern of development that exists in Tot Hill Street, although they're set back slightly from the road to allow for the retention of um, the hedge um, boundary treatment. Um, within the site itself, um, the access runs through the centre, a number of cul-de-sacs extending off of this. Along the northern boundary, this is the boundary that uh, the area of housing that would be more visible from long views from the countryside, and so the development in this location is a bit more spacious. Um, when compared to the centre of the site where there's a few more um, terraced um, and smaller units. Um, there's landscape buffers, as you can see, around the site. So along the north um, are some buns. Um, so again, in the area in pink, you can see here, that's the archaeological exclusion area. So buns have been um, provided in this location in order that tree planting can be provided. Otherwise, it would have interfered with the archaeology. So this will actually provide quite good screening and softening of the development in the wider views. Um, and again, you can see um, in terms of actual tree planting, um, tree lined streets, which is encouraged within the MPPF, and um, tree planting again in all of the open spaces. So there's a variety of unit types. I'm just going to show you a few of the street scenes um, being proposed. So the first one we're looking at is the actual Tothill Street elevation, street elevation, and then it also shows the internal access road elevation in this location here. So this top one is the Tothill Street elevation. So we have worked to try and um, improve the um, variety of materials and features within this elevation, given the fact it's, um, it's the main most prominent elevation of, of the development and it's in an area where through Top Hill Street there's a, a, a large variety of building types um, so it's we're keen to make sure that there's not just a row of singular unit types here making it very clear that it's an, um, a new development it actually could look like they've all been um, developed individually so we requested that amendments were um, provided to introduce additional bay windows within the development and uh, more varied material so this now has render black cladding um, a re and uh, red and brown brick and you can see like uh, gable features within the center so it's now felt that this elevation will um, work well in the character of the area of Tothill Street 
So the bottom of the slide is the more internal access road elevation. So I'll just quickly flick through these. So again, just, just seeing the variety of unit types being offered within the development. So the next three are showing the, this area here. So these three um, street elevations to the back of the site. So you can see here um, that they are there's a variety with different style hipped roofs, um, with some with the uh, bays at ground floor level, some with porches. And again, you can see like the cladding. So the bottom uh, street scene here is the one that would be more visible from outside the site to the north. So again, you can see the use of the black cladding, which is a bit more in keeping with rural character. And then the final one uh, is showing the long access road through the middle of the site um, and both sides of that. So, what, so the E is the, the top of the access road and F is the bottom. So these are the ones running through the middle. So again, you can just see similar, but they have, there's a few with some render, a few with gable frontages. So it's considered that the design is, um, there's enough variety within the development to be suited to the character of the village. Um, the scale of the units is, is considered to be acceptable and this is showing the variation of the materials. So you can see the plain red, multi-red and brown brick being used within the development along with red and grey tiles and the render and dark cladding across the development. So it's considered that that has enough variety to be acceptable. Um, in terms of the impact on neighbouring properties, the main concerns that have been raised from residents have been to do with overlooking to the properties in Fairfield Road. So you can see the gardens um, for these existing properties are quite long. Um, there's currently um, a garden depth of around 34 metres for these gardens. So from the rear elevation of the, of the existing neighbouring dwellings to the rear elevation of the proposed development, there's approximately 42 metres. Now that would normally be um, considered well in excess of the minimum distance we're looking for but the only additional impact here is the fact that there's the ground level change and that these properties are on a higher ground level than the existing residents and that is um, one of the main concerns that residents have raised so we did request um, section plans to try and show the relationship between the existing properties and the neighboring properties um, and so these are the properties in Fair, uh, Fairfield Road which as you remember were the bungalows and the two-story dwellings and these are the section plans that we um, had submitted. So the three red lines are showing the three different sections taken across different parts of the properties in uh, Fairfield Road. And these are the se sections. So you can see the ground level change. You can see the um, first floor windows of the development. So uh, the developers have, or the applicants have reduced the height of the development, but all they could achieve was a, a 0.3 reduction in height um, because of the ground level problems that the um, they're dealing with within the site so they couldn't go down any further because it would have caused them issues with drainage and, and highways so they did they've dropped that they've also increased the rear boundary treatment so it was originally 1.8 meters in height and now it's gone up to 2.4 meters in height and we have um, secured that through a condition that would require that to be provided um, so it is considered looking at these sections so that's one of the sections that's another section and that's the third section so it is considered that with the the slight reduction in height and the um, securing of the boundary treatment at that particular height and the overall distance that on balance the impact on um, residential amenity and privacy is considered to be acceptable. The other um, impact to look at is the impact on um, the closest properties in Tothill Street here. So um, there's a 7.5 metre distance from the side elevation of the nearest plot to the side of, of, um, the of number 114 and a 7 metre gap to the garage. So these distances are considered acceptable to limit any impact on light and outlook. There's some windows located in the side elevation of this plot and um, this plot here. Um, so a condition has been um, added to require those to be obscure glaze and non-opening below 1.7 metres. The uh, permitted development rights has also been removed for this plot here to prevent them from being allowed to build any side extensions that would um, move closer to 114. So on that basis, it's considered the impact on that property and these properties in Tothill Street is acceptable. Um, highways have been consulted. They've looked at the parking layout within the development um, parking is provided on the basis of two parking spaces per unit and one per flat. There's um, 35 uh, Vista parking spaces that are provided. Um, it did say 40 in the report, but actually 35 is the correct number in case you see a advisor that, that they are happy with that and have no concerns with it. The Vista parking spaces did increase from um, 27, which were originally submitted, so there has been an increase in that number. On this plan, you can see the Vista parking spaces are the blue um, areas, so they're mainly laid by parking close to the equipped play areas and the open space, um, and also just um, 
elsewhere along the access roads just to provide a variety throughout the development. Um, so highways have raised no concerns with the, with the parking. Tracking plans have been submitted showing that vehicles can turn within the development and that's been um, considered acceptable. And um, highways asked for a raised table to be provided in this location here in order to um, provide traffic calming within the development and that has been provided along with visibility space for all units and therefore the impact on highways is acceptable. The bridleway is one of the main issues that's been raised through this application. So the bridleway you can see on this um, plan here, so this is a KCC plan, the bridleway is shown in blue um, on the left hand side of here. So through the legal agreement for the outline application, there was a requirement for um, enhancements to the bridleway in the form of widening to three metres and the resurfacing of the bridleway. A financial contribution was secured for the resurfacing and widening of the bridleway in this location here, which is outside of the application site. So that would go to KCC and they would provide um, those enhancement works. But for the for the bridleway that falls within the application site, so everything on the western boundary, um, it was required that the applicant would have to do those works. So through this application, um, originally it was submitted that there would be the infilling of this bridleway in order to provide the widening and the resurfacing as um, it was felt that that was necessary in order to um, allow for the bridleway to be easily accessed from the development itself and for existing the existing bridleway to be joined on to the development so you can get good accessibility through the development. Um, but there was obviously strong objection from residents and the parish council to this. So this is these are the existing sections showing the bridleway. So the bridleway is on the left hand part of this slide. So you can see that it is a, a dip as you saw in the photos earlier. Um, and so the proposal was to, to infill that space. Um, this is the plan showing what would have done, what would have happened. So this would have been infilled and, and that area raised. But the concerns raised from residents is, is that it would have affected the character of the bridleway and that it's an ancient bridleway. And um, that, you know, strong, strong concerns with that have been raised. So a, um, a, visit, a site visit has taken place with a KCC Public Rights of Way and the applicant and um, the parish council. And it's been discussed whether the existing bridleway could be retained as it is without the infill works. So options have been provided by the applicant of the two possibilities. So this is the one possibility, option A, which is the infilling. So you can see the three different sections of the infilling works. And then the other proposal is to retain it as it is in terms of the um, uh, dropped down level of the bridleway, retaining the vegetation on the boundary as much as possible and on the left hand side that would be retained anyway because that falls outside the application site. Then the resurfacing of the bridleway with um, the hogging um, surface material but it probably wouldn't be widened to the three metres because that's not going to be achievable if we keep it at this lowered level. Now, KCC Public Rights of Way have come back with a, um, a comment following the publishing of the report, and they've advised that they are happy with this um, option to keep it as is, but just resurface it with the hogging. Um, they feel that that will allow for improved use of it, um, but they do feel it needs to be widened slightly, but they've accepted it wouldn't need to be the full three metres. Um, so a condition has been added to this report. Um, it's... Uh, Condition 12, and it's requiring full details of the um, bridleway following survey work that's going to be carried out. So full details of the design um, and the vegetation and the retention of vegetation. So we'd get everything in showing how it's going to be retained and how the vegetation will be retained. And we will consult KCC um, for their comments on that. But that is the, the intended approach now. And I think everybody's in agreement with that. Parish Council have also written in to me advising that they are also in agreement of um, that approach so um, hopefully that is that is the solution um, it wouldn't involve us having to um, sort of go back to the legal agreement because there was a clause in the legal agreement said that said to best endeavors that they would achieve the three meters so to achieve something slightly less than that if in agreement with everybody else including KCC then that would be um, achievable so that is the, the current proposal. So these are the three sections, just showing it as it is. And then this is the layout plan that would show the connection into the development. So there would have to be um, footpaths that would be dug out and some retaining walls either side of the footpath just to get down to that lower level. But it is achievable. It might be that there's slightly fewer connection points potentially, but it is achievable that you can get a few connections onto it at that level. 
So it's considered that that is acceptable. KCC are happy with it, um, and that that's, will be the approach. So in terms of just general landscaping, this is the landscaping master plan for the site. So you can see everything in green is, is um, either uh, tree planting, or you can see hedge planting. Uh, along this boundary here so this again the bridal way is the bottom of this slide now and there's a proposal that that would need a four meter wide hedge along it which will help to um, secure ecological enhancements within the site um, a biodiversity method statement has been submitted there's currently um, surveys that have shown there are slow worms and um, reptiles within the site so during construction they're all going to be moved into the um, cemetery expansion area and then they're going to be moved back into the open spaces once the development's um, been completed so the impact on biodiversity is is considered acceptable there's enhancements as well through this plan through um uh wildflower planting and and large areas like that that will be secured for um biodiversity and in terms of the drainage um the final point there was again concerns raised uh, with residents regarding drainage um so through this scheme, the proposal was to provide uh, basins in this location here, so on the right-hand side of, of this screen. At the bottom of the site would be large basins and uh, swales would run th along the boundary to the rear of Greenhill Gardens. Um, and these would allow uh, surface water to be contained on the site, but eventually um, move into the um, combined sewer. Um, they can't have all water um, uh, go... Uh, infiltration on the site because there will be a contamination issue because there's be too much and it's a groundwater protection area so much of the water will need to go into the combined sewer and um, southern water at the moment have concerns because there's lack of capacity in the area so they're going to be carrying out a capacity um, a design assessment and working out where the improvements need to be made the developer will um, finance that and pay for the the uh, Capa uh, capacity improvements where it's affected by the development and that's going to be carried out separately through um, a separate process with Southern Water. So at the moment there's not considered to be any drainage issues, the condition linked to the outline has been um, discharged um, and the um, approach that's been um, proposed through this, this application and through the outline application is, is considered to be accepted. So overall um, the development is considered to be in keeping with the area. It achieves um, a, a large number of new units which have already been approved through the outline application. The impact on <laughs> residents is considered to be acceptable and there's no other issues raised by any other consultees, so it is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you. I move that the officer's recommend recommendation is adopted. Can I ask the vice chair to second that, please? Seconded, chair. Thank you. Um, does anyone want to speak? Right. Um, Councillor Garner, sorry, your, your name went from here. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I do have a couple of um, concerns and questions which I'd like to just explore a little bit, um, which then might help me and others to make our minds up about the... Um, the scale, whether the scale of this development is actually sustainable going forward, um, and the landscaping as well. So, I mean, at the end of the report there, um, Emma mentioned about Southern Water um, and um, flood risk of flooding. But I, I did have a look at the um, Southern Water report from 13th of March. Where they, where they said that um, they'd undertaken a desktop, desktop study uh, and the, additional, the impact of the additional surface water flows from the proposed element will have, an existing, will have on the existing public sewer network. And they show that there, are, there is likely to be an increased risk of flooding, as you, as you mentioned. And they have said that they do need, as, as you mentioned, a condition uh, that would be phased and implemented in the line with the delivery of sewage network reinforcement that's required here. So I mean, I think I don't need to, I don't need to reiterate the issues we have around here with southern water sewage. We're all very familiar with that, and there is there isn't any way that this isn't going to have any anything other than an adverse impact on the issues that we have unless they combine any work they do to make this development accessible with the work that they need to do 
to um, provide all of us who already live in here with a, a fit for purpose um, sewage system. Um, so I, I am very concerned about that. And in fact, I would, it would be nice if they could um, supply a bit more of a detailed report which would outline um, how they're going to deal with this extra sewage and what impact it might have on the amount of sewage that's released into the sea already around our coast to help us to um, come to a better, a better understanding of whether this is sustainable. Um, another question I have is around air quality, because I remember from the... Well, no, I don't remember. I looked through and saw that one of the conditions on the outline proposal was that they were asked to provide an air quality emissions statement. And I think that's relevant because we are adding here 133 houses, which are, I mean, it's good to hear they've all got charging points, but the vast majority of these houses won't have electric cars. Most of them will have more than one car, and they, they will all be having an adverse effect on the air quality of the area. So I'd, I would be interested to know if that um, emissions report has been produced already. Um, now looking at, looking at the, uh, the slide you've got up there now, I mean, there, is, there are a large number, I mean, it's acceptable, as you say, um, as per uh, to the, the, the size of each of these plots, um, but I suspect it's, it's just about acceptable. They don't look, uh, they do look a bit crammed to me. What I can't see from that is the gardens and what, what part of each of the plots is in fact garden. Um, and that, that, has a new, that does have a bearing in terms of linking in with this, the uh, flooding. Because uh, I do know when I look at some of the other new new estates that are being built, there are minimal gardens and um, maximum um, concrete uh, down around the back and the front of the houses. So could you give us an indication of of the size of guard, each of the gardens? Else, it looks like that all the residents, if they want a bit of an open space, rather than stepping out of the rather than stepping out of the back door into their garden or the front door, they're going to have to step out, walk down to uh, walk down to the quite substantial, as I'll admit, the, the green space around around all the houses. Is there are there opportunities for them to? I went to the open gardens over that way, and it'd be nice if some of these were able to have gardens that they would be able to make <coughs> open to members of the public at the open garden. So. Are there gardens there? That's what, one of the things I'd like to know. And I'd also like just confirmation, the access at the top there, on the, the highway access, that is a single access to, to all 133 dwellings in and out. So the potential, all of the 200, potential 266 plus cars are all going to enter this site through that single, that single access, which not being overly familiar, but I am, I have been up and down there a few times. It's always difficult to get up and down because of parked cars on either side. There's, everyone's giving way all the time, so another 200 plus houses is going to add a, an issue, excepting that KCC say it's acceptable, but um, I think that the scale, it does have an impact on whether the scale of the de this development is in fact sustainable. And will that be the same access to the other 91 houses or uh, units that are going to be built in phase two? Or did I notice a, another access at the bottom of the site? Because that, that um, would make a difference. So for now, if we could, if there were a number of questions there, I know, but if, if you could help with those, that would, that would help me formulate my opinion. Thank you. Emma's going to come back to you. 
Okay, um, in terms of the drainage, there was a, f a foul drainage condition on the outline application. That's not been discharged yet, so we've not had any details of the foul drainage. Um, but what Southern Water have always said is that they will not allow the occupation of any of the dwellings until the um, network reinforcement works for the drain existing drainage have been carried out. So through the agreement that they, um, the applicant is going to have to have with the um, with Southern Water under the uh, Water Industry Act 1991, um, they would um, have an arrangement in place that they can only occupy a certain number of units as the reinforcement works are carried out. So there will at no point be an issue with um, units being occupied with inadequate drainage in the area. So that will all be dealt with through the conditions linked to the outline and th separately through Southern Water through um, the Water Industry Act. Um, in terms of air quality, so I didn't cover air quality because I was trying to keep the presentation as, as, as short as I could, um, but uh, a report was submitted with the application, which was the emissions mitigation statement, um, and that looked at the air quality, uh, looked at air quality, and basically sets out what they're doing within the development to try and reduce the impact on um, air quality. So through the air quality assessment, they identify. A, um, a mitigation cost which basically through the number of units what um, damage cost is likely to be um, created on air quality and they have to use that cost to then um, provide um, things within the development to try and reduce it so it's not an actual financial contribution but it's they have to show that they have provided things so that can be in the form of landscaping um, it can be uh, pedestrian and cycle routes to try and reduce people relying on the car um, I mean, they've also said within the statement that because they're doing um, financial contributions to improve the highway network, that in itself will reduce the impact on air quality. So the Environment Health Officer has raised no concerns with the mitigation um, assessment that's been submitted. They're obviously also doing electric vehicle charging, which we now require as a standard anyway for these types of development. Um, so the impact on, on air quality is dealt with and, and considered to be fine. Um, in terms of your comment on gardens, so they all have Dorset play space, every single unit, including the flats. Either, I don't know if you can see, maybe this plan is a bit too small, but in the centre here, these are the flats and the gardens are divided, so each of the flats can get access to a garden, so the, the top floor would have to come out and walk down a side access to get to it, but they all have gardens, there's no units without its own garden. Um, in terms of the depth, I think it ranges around 8 to 10 metres probably, which is probably quite standard for a, a new build unit. It's not the deepest of gardens, but again, you can see that there is a lot of open space within the site and you've got the Dorset play space, uh, um, uh, the play areas even. Um, so they, all they have is a requirement to provide the Dorset play space. We don't have any minimum standards for that. So that they have achieved it. So the, the gardens are considered to be acceptable. And in terms of access into the site, so this is the, the main vehicular access into the site, and this would serve the whole development, including um, future phases. But this access running um, down the bottom here, that's the emergency access. So I don't know if you can see it better. I'll show it on, hmm, it's not really highlighted here, but this one running through the middle um, here comes out into Green Hill Gardens, and that would be the emergency access. So if there was an ever, ever a problem, um, in here and they needed to, to you know, emergency vehicles to get into the site and couldn't get into the site from the front then that would provide that emergency access um, but I, I believe the reason that there was no um, additional main access provided is that because of the issues in Minster with vehicle movements it was considered that the access in this location at the top of Tothill Street most residents would basically come out the access and head straight out of the village so you're not going to be blocking up the centre of the village where the commercial area is they're going to be heading straight out so it's actually quite a good location for an access where it shouldn't be having a, a huge amount of impact on the majority of Tothill Street it's just at the top end of Tothill Street where they come out and head straight out so that's um, I believe why that was probably agreed like that so but again yeah that was agreed through the outline so it's not really a consideration for this application. Thank you. Councillor Alban. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, I think, obviously, uh, development such as this is, uh, goes against the grain in relation to the use of farmland. However, that particular issue has been taken out of our hands. Um, and overall, looking at the whole of the development as 
as, as up there, um, it's the applicant has pretty much covered everything, everything within the application that it needs to. Um, so I can't really see, a, a, I'm looking for a reason to refuse it, and I can't actually find one. Um, so that's all I'm saying. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Bayford. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Emma, for the <coughs> detailed presentation. Um, I very much welcome the confirmation that the bridal way will be retained and enhanced. Um, I also welcome the retention of many of the hedgerays, rows, and the uh, sorry, the drop of the height of many of, of, many of the units. Um, the actors have been approved by KCC. Personally, I feel that this is a mix of, un of excellent mix of units, um, including affordable housing. Um, the landscaping is extensive, uh, and the we have parking, gardens, and I. I personally welcome 133 dwellings which were very, very much needed. Thank you. Councillor Wing. Thank you. I, I always have to have a little chuckle when I hear the term ecological enhancements to, once, to what once was uh, A-grade farmland. It always makes me chuckle a little and, and make me quite sad, actually, but, you know, that is out of our hands. Could I ask, what is the present number of dwellings in Minster? Does anybody know the present number of dwellings in Minster? It appears not. Because <laughs> I, I, I'd like to know, 133 houses in one big lump with an, an, a number to follow probably represents a significant percentage increase in the number of dwellings in a village. Uh, so I wish we did have that number because then we'd be able to put a percentage figure on that. Uh, I, too, have real concerns about the lack of detail from Southern Water. We know that the villages are, uh, are serviced by their own water treatment plant, uh, and as the report states, there are already capacity issues. So I think if this 33 plus the rest it represents a, a, a significant percentage in the, in, the, in the number of dwellings uh, in the village of Minster, then we are heading for... Uh, greater capacity issues, and I would certainly welcome greater detail uh, from Southern Water before we can sit here and make a decision. I, don't, I think it's a bit of, of, of the, horse, the horse before the cart to say, build it and we'll stop anybody living it, li in it until the issues are dealt with. I'm not sure any of us would uh, be doing that with our own properties. We'd be solving the problem uh, first. Uh, so it really does concern me that we've got one phase of building here where there are already capacity issues with southern water, with water needs and the, deal and the treatment of uh, waste, waste water. Uh, and we're going to allow this build, build to go ahead without having a, that detailed information that gives us a guarantee that what will need to be done will be done to protect the people that will be living in these, in these buildings and also the existing owners, uh, the, the existing residents, <coughs> plus our own environment and our seas and waterways. Uh, so I'd, I'd, I personally would like more information. Could I also ask, what's the net gain of trees and hedgerows, and is there any uh, aftercare? Because we know quite often you've only got to drive through Westwood Cross and see trees that have never received any aftercare that are dead and dying. So it's all very well saying we're going to plant so many trees and put the hedgerows in, but unless there is a commitment to four or five years of aftercare, those trees and hedgerows will disappear. Uh, I, I appreciate the fact that the archaeological areas will be protected. That, that's really good to know. But, but how will they be protected? Uh, will they be left open? Will they, will they have hedgerows around them to protect them? Will there be open grassland? I can't really see them in that development there. So how will these archaeological areas be protected? Uh, 
also building 133 houses in a small village. I mean, one we all know on our own streets. Once somebody does some work to their building, it creates a right kerfuffle on the street and upsets everybody for a few months. So, what 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 have we got in in place to mitigate against uh, deliveries, workforce parking, uh, noise, vibration, dust uh, in 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 such a small village? Uh, you know, it's not a big open area that all of this stuff has got to come through the village and all of this stuff has got to be worked on within the village. Uh, uh, I think that's it. They're, they're my main areas of concern. My biggest area of concern is obviously the lack of detail from Southern Water. Sorry, I hand back to the officers. Uh, sorry, just to so to cover a few of those points. So in terms of the number of units, so we don't know how many um, units are currently in the village, but in terms of this site, it is a housing allocation site. That's why the outline was approved. And the, um, the policy for the housing allocation was for 250 units, and we've approved 214. So we've already approved well below what the policy would have allowed for. So the policy would allow for a much larger number of units on this. But as I said before, this is because of... Um, the archaeological exclusion zones that came to light probably after the allocation um, policy was created, which has restricted how much of the site can be developed. So, you know, it's, for the village, it's better than it could have been. <laughs> um, in terms of the archaeological areas, in terms of their protection, they don't actually need to be fenced off or anything like that. They're, in terms of their protection, they just don't need to, they can't be developed. So we can't dig down in those areas. So that's why they are areas that are open green space. Um, and that's why when I mentioned earlier about the buns, so along the, the north where the red is, uh, along the northern boundary, in order to get tree planting, which we would obviously want to see um, along the boundary to help soften the development from longer views, they are going to be um, building buns, which again we have conditions, we can get details in of that, but that way they can plant the trees in the buns and all the roots will go into the buns and not go down underground and not disturb the archaeology. So that is how the archaeology is being protected, but it's not it doesn't need to be fenced off or anything like that. So that, that is dealt with by just not being developed. Um, and in terms of the impact from construction vehicles, they've already submitted their construction, um, construction management plan through the condition that was attached to the outline, and that's been approved by highways. Um, I don't have the details of that here. It, it should be online now for, for people to see um, because we've already approved it. Um, but... I mean, they would have looked at the impact on the village and timings and, and things like that for, for vehicle deliveries, um, because I know some residents have already raised some concerns with vehicles blocking areas when they were doing the archaeological works and things. So it's understood that it's something that residents are, are sensitive to. Um, so we would just, you know, make sure, try and make sure that we would enforce it if there were concerns that residents felt that they weren't complying with the construction management plan and obviously contact us and we will ask our enforcement team to investigate it. Sorry, I'll, I'll, pick up the, yeah. I'll pick up the other points. Um, yeah. So in terms of, first of all, there is a net gain of trees on the site, mm. just straight off, uh, in terms of the number that are on the site at the moment. Obviously, it's, it's empty mm. farmland, effectively, so there is a net gain of trees. So there's a very specific condition which is usually put on major developments, which is more extensive than our normal landscaping condition, which is condition nine that's on the outline, which is about the provision of a landscape and ecolog ecological management plan which has to be submitted before uh, the first occupation of any dwelling. So that has to include um, all sorts of details about management actions, work schedule, objectives of the management, details of any board, body or organisation that's going to carry out that work and continue to carry it out on this site through the 106 as well. Um, there'll be the requirement for a management company to maintain the areas of open space. So that's another sort of hook that we have to control what comes forward on the site. Um, I think the only other point was to do with um, I suppose southern water again. Um, I mean, it, in terms of, I appreciate the concerns with regards to, um, I suppose it's, it's about the role of planning. Fundamentally, planning has the ability to mitigate further impacts of what would be created by putting 133, or in this instance, 214 as per approved at the outline. Um, we can mitigate that impact, and therefore the timing of getting the mitigation before those dwellings is occupied is entirely in accordance with case law about what we can and can't do through this planning uh, permission that was granted to outline. So that's why it's timed in the way that it is. Thank you, Chair. I, I, I'm a bit, I don't I really understand that. Maybe it's because I'm not a planner, but 
Imagine six months down the, down the road, Southern Water in its further detailed study says that X, Y and Z needs to be done, but the houses have already been built, and X, Y and Z can't be done because the houses are already up there. That's my concern, is that, that, that uh, 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 we need, I feel that we need to know exactly what needs to be done to address the capacity issues which Southern Water and this planning application has already identified exists. So it's not, we're already in a bad place and we're going to add additional houses. So it really, really does concern me that, that we start building something that may have to be adapted once Southern Water have done this more detailed study. Surely the detailed study should be done and then, and then the, the, the application looked at to see if th those, those po possible necessary changes can be put into that. Because I'm assuming any adaptations will be to do with reducing the amount of water. So is there grey water harvesting already in these dwellings? Have we got an internal issue, you know, low flush toilets? Uh, and some of those issues, issues will, will be to do with how water is taken away from the site. Now that's all underground. So I, I'm a bit, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not a developer and I'm not an engineer. But I, I can't get my head around, we already have a capacity issue, we're going to allow a, a build to go ahead and drains be put in before we actually get a detailed uh, assessment and survey from Southern Water who already admit there's, there are capacity issues. Officer, come straight back in. Um, so any network reinforcement, excuse me, any network reinforcement works is obviously going to be off-site because obviously there's no drainage across the site at the moment. Um, to your point in terms of the, the timing or the assessment that's done, um, this is something that we talked about previously about what's required by different bits of legislation in terms of the Water Industry Act as mentioned. Um, planning obviously can try and facilitate and make sure that there is capacity for the new dwellings that are, that are going in, but fundamentally the actual agreement to connect to uh, the existing foul drainage network and indeed the capacity of that network is something that is covered by the separate legislation when the agreement needs to be sought by the developer with Southern Water. Now obviously part of the work that's done on the local plan for all strategic allocations including this application um, or this site when it, when it came through was obviously as Adrian mentioned in the training consultation with Southern Water about capacity and planning for this number of houses over that period of time but it is understood that with every site as it comes forward there is going to need to be very specific work that's carried out but that is governed primarily by the Water Infrastructure Act and, and not by a consideration that we make. Now, we do have some control. I think it's really important that, as I say, the Grampian conditions that we put on the, you know, you can't, you can't actually develop the site, you can't actually build anything until we've agreed the method of drainage for foul water. So, to your point about um, actually the, the principles behind what they're going to do, uh, of which we obviously do, Southern Water asks that condition, and we therefore, if we need to, we would go back to them on that. Um, they do need to agree that with us up front, but as mentioned, Southern Water won't allow them to occupy certain dwellings, and indeed there's obviously more technical aspects that building regs as well look at when they're connecting, um, that would need to basically mean that you cannot obviously occupy those dwellings until the issue is dealt with. I appreciate we, we go into this area and it's obviously a strategic concern uh, that is something that we know is, is very important for strategic allocations and just generally in the district. The important thing with regards to this reserve matters, though, is that the actual principle of the number of dwellings, the capacity of the network, has been agreed at outline. It's been agreed. That's why there's a Grampian condition on the outline and not on the reserve matters. So that is a matter that was dealt with at the outline application and would be dealt with at that stage rather than the detailed layout um, that we're looking at this evening. OK, do I have anyone else who wants to speak? In that case, we will now put the motion for the officer's recommendation for approval to the vote. Those in favour? And those against? And any abstentions? Thank you. So the motion is carried. Uh, moving on to the next item is the Recomet Recycling Centre. Uh, first off, I have speaking in favour of the application, Mr. Tony Michael. Do we have Mr. Tony Michael here? Um, you have three minutes, please. Thank you. 
Madam Chair, members, officers, thank you for your time this evening. We would also like to thank Gillian Dawes, the case officer, for her usual fair and professional work on the application as well. The merits of this application are as shown in the report. It is recommended for approval and I only wish to summarise a few points from this report. The site has a long history of commercial use, dating back to 1963. This is 60 years of such use. Reclamet have made all applications as necessary over these many years. All Kent Highway's requirements have been agreed to and they have no objection to this application. Environmental health have no objection. The increased floor space of an established business is supported by policy uh, from the report. No harm to the wider countryside. Acceptable in principle given the established use of the site. No harm in terms of overshadowing, loss of light, outlook, overlooking to neighbours. Only one complaint, and this from a site 60 metres away, and no harm adjudged to fall upon them. Therefore, all acceptable in regards to residential amenity. Kent Highways have also confirmed a negligible impact on the road network by this very small increase in office space. Those were the salient planning grounds. There was a complaint um, from the adjacent neighbour at Nelson Park that not related to the application but my client wished to respond to to these um, one was smoke from burning my client wished to say the operation of the site um, and operation of the site outside permitted uh, hours to answer this my client says reclamate does not employ the use of fire for burning of any materials instead they use specialized machinery in this only to maintain equipment this generates minimal heat to minimal smoke that reclamate adhere to stringent guidelines. They are highly regulated by the Environment Agency, Health and Safety Executive, and many other agencies. Um, their machinery undergoes regular maintenance and inspection to ensure optimum efficiency and compliance. There has never been a fire at reclamate. Only on one occasion were the council uh, attended due to complaint uh, in regards to a possible fire. It was actually uh, observed that this was minor smoke generated from cutting a broken bolt off a piece of equipment. This the council officer observed there was no breach and witnessed only essential maintenance. Their operating hours they comply strictly to uh, and they regularly conduct their own sound impact assessment which is required by the Environment Agency and this ensures compliance with their operating hours uh, and their noise levels. They operate under a magnifying glass and they take this very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. I will now ask the Principal Planning Officer to outline the report. Well, thank you, Chair. So this is the... Oh. Sorry, going the wrong way. Uh, this is the application site. Sorry, I keep touching the mouse in the wrong position. This is the application site. So we've got Woodchurch Road, uh, Reclement. Um, there with its car storage and car parking area to the front there. So this is the application site outlined in red as normal and as has been mentioned it's for the erection of first floor extensions to two um, office buildings to provide additional office floor space. Um, so this is um, looking at down Woodchurch Road with Reclement on your right hand side there and just looking the other way down um, Woodchurch Road again with Reclement now on the left hand side and you can see their car park. Um, the two office buildings have been um, helpfully shown by the applicant as Office A and Office B so we'll have a look at those um, with some photos of both those office buildings. So this is Office Building A so you can see it sits here and has a larger sort of workshop building behind it. Uh, that's enough of you of the uh, building, office building A, and enough of building, uh, enough of you of it there as well. Um, and this is actually looking further out from Woodchurch Road um, outside of the site. So that's the site boundary. So office building A sits in, within the site here. So you can see it is not particularly visible from that part of Woodchurch Road, though you do get views of it when you are at the front of the site. Um, so now looking back towards Office Building B, 
it's actually located, this is looking across the parking area of the site that we saw, and the building is in this location here. Um, so we're looking at the building here, this, so this is office building B as it's referred to in the application. This is a domestic residential property outside the application site, Hillside. Um, this is enough of you of building B and you can see hillside behind it and again this is looking from the front of the site so this is building B and you can see hillside adjacent there. Uh, this is actually a picture of hillside and you will note that there is a gap between um, the application site so the recommend site and building uh, so office building B would be over here but there is a gap there between it. So, as I say, we've looked at um, the photographs of the two buildings and the general site, so we'll just look at the plans as proposed. So this is existing um, parking plan, so you can see there's parking, as we just saw there, and some parking adjacent to office building A. And this is the proposed um, parking plan so it's an increase of 10 parking spaces to serve with the additional um, office space that would be created and there's also a cycle store in this location here which were requested by KCC highways when they looked at the application and amended plans were provided by the applicants to provide additional those 10 additional parking spaces and the cycle store so this is front elevation of um, office A that we looked at as existing. Um, this is the front elevation as proposed. Um, it will be increased to a maximum height of 6.5 metres and the additional space that would be created and we will look at the floor plans in a moment would be 102 square metres of additional floor space. Um, so just running through the upper elevations of this building, this is existing, the side elevation of Office A and the proposed side elevation, its rear elevation and the rear elevation is proposed and we have the upper existing side and proposed side. So this is the ground floor um, of the building as it stands now. You can see the workshop here and this is the actual office bit in this location here. So it stays broadly the same at ground floor level here, but obviously the introduction of stairs. And then this is the additional uh, floor space that's created. So as I said, it's 102 additional square metres within that building. So going back to um, office building B, it's, it was the flat roof building that we saw adjacent to Hillside. So this is existing front elevation, the proposed front elevation. It's side elevation as existing and it's proposed side elevation, it's rear elevation, it's proposed elevation, a uh, rear elevation. And in this one, this is the existing floor plan as it stands now. And this is the ground floor that's proposed. As you can see, we have a staircase going up here and that takes us up to the proposed um, first floor. And on that building, it's an additional 81 square metres of office space created at first floor level. And it would have, it retains its flat roof as we've re seen, um, but it has a maximum height of 5.8 metres. So as um, I've already mentioned, there were no concerns about traffic generation for the additional floor space from KCC highways. Um, they considered that to be negligible and it would not have an impact on the free flow of traffic movement in the area. They did raise the concerns about additional parking requirements and the need for cycle storage, which, as I've already mentioned, have been provided by the applicant. In terms of living conditions, there are, is no impact from, on residential amenity from the works to... Um, office A, as we've seen, it's on the edge of the site and it, it won't be noticeable either from um, outside the site other than from the sort of actual real frontage of the site. 
um, Office B is next to um, Hillside, which is, as I've mentioned, is a, d a domestic residential property. And but it is noted that Hillside is actually on land that is actually slightly higher than the application site by approximately one metre. Um, there is a close boarded fence of approximately 4.4 metres high along the boundary between the two sites and there are some trees along the site. And as we've already seen, there is a, a gap between the actual residential property and there's a sort of garage outbuilding um, there in that location. So given the, the gap there, the limited height of 5.8 metres and the boundary treatment and the angle between Office B and Hillside, it is considered there would not be an adverse impact or significant adverse impact on the residential amenity of, of the occupiers of that property to cause a sense of enclosure, loss of light or and there would be no windows in that um, elevation of the first floor of the office building to cause overlooking. So the officer recommendation is for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I move that the officer's recommendation is adopted. Can I have that seconded, please, Vice Chair? Seconded. Thank you. And who would like to speak? Councillor Matterface. Uh, just a one quick question. Uh, you tell us in the report, and you've said just now, how high the buildings would be, but how high are the buildings at the moment? So how much extra is being added to the two office buildings, please? We'll just wait a moment. Yeah, apologies, I'll, we'll have to check that. Okay, okay. in that case, Councillor Keane. Looking at the plans and the impact, I mean, Reclamet is not our prettiest development, but I don't see any planning reasons to refuse this. Thank you. Thank you. Ready? Just be, bear with us, we're working on it. Um, so uh, the Office B is uh, 2.7 to 5.7. Um, so yeah, it's obviously adding, adding the additional floor on top, so it's the, it's the sort of full height. And so the extension to Office A, uh, bear with me one second. Oh, yeah. Um, so the existing part of Office A that's single storey is uh, sort of 2.5 to eaves, but then the roof pitches up to attach to the building, which goes up to a height of about 4.8. And then the what would occur is effectively the existing roof would just carry on with the extension. That existing roof currently pitches to 6.5 at its very apex. Yeah, heights. Councillor Wing. Uh, just a bit of clarification. So that, that residential property, do we have some sort of elevation that shows the height of the building? And are there any windows on that side that, that, that could potentially overlook that property? Um, I don't exactly have an elevation that... There are no windows in the elevation of either the flank elevation of the house that faces onto it or the proposed extension at first floor level that faces onto it. So if, if that answers the question. Anyone else? In that case, um, I will move for the motion for the officer's recommendation for approval to the vote. Um, those in favour? Right, 
Thank you. The motion is carried. Moving on to the next item, um, land adjacent to the Clifftop, North Foreland Avenue Broadstairs. Speaking against the application is Theo Niccolo. Thank you. Three minutes. Thank you. I'm here representing the views and concerns of all eight residents at Redriff. As, as a resident of the North Forland estate, I have a vested interest to preserve the quality of the estate, in particular the issues of biodiversity, the environment, and potential overdevelopment of sites. With specific reference to the proposed eight-bay garage and annex block, this unreasonable and disproportionate provision of parking for a, we believe this is a disproportionate uh, provision of parking for a four-bed property. We highlight that the annex total internal gross area is 292 square metres, is an additional 43.3% of the extremely large 672 square metre area of the main house. The annex in its current form would therefore represent excessive overdevelopment in terms of scale, size and in particular location. We'd also like to draw the Council's attention to the following local local plans and government leg legislation which has clearly not been adhered to. These are Broadstairs and St Peter's Neighbourhood Development Plan 2018 and to 2031. Also Thanet District adopted Local Plan 2020 Quality Development. Furthermore, the National Planning Policy Framework states that the local planning authorities should consider policies to resist inappropriate development of residential gardens within, de within where development would cause harm to the local area. Furthermore, in Thanet, residential gardens are also form part of Thanet's green infrastructure providing di biodiversity and wildlife habitats. Also, consideration to uh, the Town and Country Planning Act 1990 and the new legislation regarding biodiversity net gain set at 10%. Also, we have concerns regarding implied backland developments where sites may be overdeveloped to the rear of plots. The rear development is excessively overbearing in height. We cannot ascertain from the proposals the construction ground floor datum. There is also no reference to topographical survey. This application is, has a, is a significant overbearing impact and it's based on overdevelopment of the site, scale and height of the annex, proximity and boundary to, uh, and overlooking issues, increased noise and disturbance from, that will be generated from the garages, blocking of lights on to Redriff, and finally the clear lack of adherence to local council guidance. In our submissions, we have proposed some solutions to these concerns. We conclude that the proposed annex for a disabled person would, from a health and safety perspective, be more appropriate as a ground level annex without a stair access. I would also finally like to share with you that I have been advised that it is the intention of the applicant to market this plot for sale with planning. I would therefore ask the committee to seriously reconsider the, the, to consider the reason for this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I will now hand over to the Principal Planning Officer to outline the report. Thank you, Chair. So this is the application site outlined in red. You have Cliff Promenade running north to south here on the right hand side and this is North Forland Avenue. So this is an aerial photo. So here we have Cliff Promenade, North Forland Avenue here and this is the application site in this location here. Um, this is a, a 3D view. Um, it's really to give members an idea of how the land levels sort of slope down and North Forland Avenue is along here and it's at a higher level um, than Cliff Promenade and this is Redriff, um, the Redriff apartment block that's been mentioned um, by the speaker just a moment ago and hopefully members can see that it is at a higher level and then you have the garden coming out um, and that's actually terrace and you can see a series of sort of la uh, levels where the land drops down and you can see if you look at the buildings that's North, um, yeah, North Forland Grange is at a much lower level as are the other buildings on Cliff Promenade. So we've got some photographs of the site so we're in Cliff Promenade 
And this is North Fallen Grange, which we saw in the photograph of uh, the aerial image earlier. And the application for the site is on the right hand side here. This is looking the other way. Um, so we're still in Cliff Promenade. That's the edge of Red Riff apartment block on the left here. And you can see um, some vacant sites here that the properties and hopefully you can members can make out that the land level here is lower than the level at, at the top there where those at North Falland Avenue where those properties face. So again we're looking still in Cliff Promenade looking towards apologies I've forgotten the name of that house <laughs> but we're looking um, further down away from the site so the site would be behind the car and on the left hand side there but you can see the distance of cliff promenade and the cliff as well there and again this is a view um, looking onto the application site over the fence of the gate there and hopefully members can make out there's some sort of terracing and changes in land level up to red riff at the higher level there and again, this is a wider view of a similar that we've just seen. So that's Red Reef here, the application site, and some of the vacant plots that haven't been built out in this location here. Um, this is the existing site plan. And so this is the application site. It does have actual um, levels um, set out on the site on that plan but you, I appreciate members will not be able to see them but there were was topographical information submitted with the application when it was submitted to us so we can understand the levels of where things are proposed so this is Red Riff in the location here um, this is the plot to the south has um, had consent for a uh, dwelling on the site um, and there is actually a current application for a dwelling on the site now that is actually under consideration. Um, but looking at the application site, it is not considered that there would be an issue with that coming forward for development. So if members were to grant this application on this plot here, it would not um, prohibit this application that we've got also being allowed. Um, the plot to the north, which is shown here as plot seven if members can read that refers to an out, old outline application which now um, reserve matters um, was um, granted some time ago in 2019 for a dwelling on that site that um, a reserve matters application has now expired but again it is fought by officers that the the development and of the application the dwelling and the annex on this site, as proposed, would not prohibit the adjoining sites coming forward and being developed if applications were submitted. But obviously they would have to work around any um, approval on this site. So this is a proposed site plan. So Cliff Promenade is here. We have the main house set back in this location here. And it's actually set back some 15 metres from the front of the application site. It's approximately 1.8 metres at its closest point to the southern plot, uh, the, the plot to the south. And I think it's six metres to the boundary of the plot to the north there. Um, the annex sits to the rear here. The main house itself would be about 15 metres from the rear of the application site but it is appreciated that the annex obviously is much closer to the rear of the site being um, just over a meter or so from that so again just to refresh me uh, members memories so we're looking at the site here this is the site as i said where we have the current application on but it's the adjoining site for a dwelling in this location here um, but just to refresh members that this is the rear of uh, the Red Riff apartment site. As you can see, the, bed, uh, the building actually steps down. There are, is um, a flat here. And, it, and I would point out to members 
that this application we're considering tonight has had a previous consent um, in 2019 for the exact same development with the annex and the dwelling as proposed. Um, it's being resubmitted because they did not commence works within the three years that were granted, but it was um, submitted at the same time that Red Riff was granted consent. Um, Red Riff was granted consent actually in two phases. It was granted consent initially for seven dwellings. It then came in for some underground parking, and then there was a subsequent application to add the unit hit that you see here um, to make the whole um, development eight units. So that's the single unit that was added on at a later stage. So um, it, when the original application was granted in 2019 for the dwelling on this site with its annex, um, Red Riff was already um, granted consent. Obviously, it wasn't built out or completed at that stage and what certainly wasn't occupied, but consideration was given when um, permission was granted for the dwelling and the annex on the site we're considering tonight, uh, the impact on Red Riff. So this is actually the proposed um, front facing, so east facing elevation of the house. So this is what you would see from a cliff promenade. Obviously it's set further back so it wouldn't be um, as noticeable as you see it here. <laughs> Um, this is the west-facing elevation, so the rear elevation. And this is the north-facing elevation. So that's the one facing the plot that had the consent but, ha but has now expired. This is the plot facing onto the south, so this would face onto the site that we have the current application on. Um, and this is the annex. So this is the east-facing um, part of the annex. So this would face onto the house and as has been mentioned it's a two-story annex essentially with the annex being on the upper floor and we'll look at the floor plans in a little while but at, it does have a series of garages which would accommodate approximately eight cars. Um, it, uh, as I understand it from the applicants and their agents he is a collector of cars, so it's not for any business purposes or anything like that. He just wants to store his cars in a secure building. Um, so it would not be used for business purposes, as I've mentioned. It would be just to accommodate his private vehicles. And um, I'm, I'm not aware that there is a issue if you have space that you have a limit of how many vehicles you could keep for domestic purposes if they are purely for that purpose. But uh, so looking at the north facing um, elevation of the annex, this is the west facing annex. So this would be the view that properties in North Forland Avenue, particularly Red Riff, um, people in the Red Riff apartments would get of the application of the annex. So it is essentially a blank elevation with some high level um, windows here and that's the staircase. Um, concerns ha have been raised um, about the height of the building as we've heard but also the potential for overlooking um, when people are using the staircase. Um, it's not considered, I'll go back to the changes in levels and things that are in a moment but just to touch on the basis that we do not consider there would be overlooking from people coming and going from the, um, using the stairs and the entrance to the annex because it would be just precisely for that. There's not enough room for sitting out there and they would be using and enjoying the garden of the main house because it is a, um, additional accommodation and incidental, not a separate dwelling. So we do not have concerns that there would be overlooking or a sense of overlooking from people just using the staircase to enter and access the annex. So that's the proposed self-facing um, elevation. So you can see the staircase in more detail and you can see it really is just a staircase to get up and into and out of the annex. So this is the actual ground floor of the property. So you can see you've got the main sort of living accommodation of the house in this area here. And then you've got some a gym and swimming pool and plant room and various sort of 
um, accommodation like that there, but the main living space is here. This is the annex, and as you can see, as I've mentioned before, it is garage spaces at the ground floor level. Um, so this is the upper floor. So uh, as you can see, the sort of the main house sits here so with the bedrooms and the upper floor accommodation. This is basically storage at this level. And in the annex, it would have two bedrooms, en suite, um, it, and obviously it's kitchen and living room at this end. So this is a north facing uh, section through the site. And you, as you can see, that we're looking from Cliff Promenade over on the left hand side of the slide. The land levels rise up a little and then level off with the house and the annex. And what the applicants are proposing to do is actually drop down um, the back end of the application site to the same level as the main bit of the house, the site where the house would be built. And this was proposed uh, on the application that was approved. Um, and we're looking again at the south facing elevation. So again, you can see that that level would be consistent. So in terms of, and this is a site section that's been drawn up to show the difference between Red Riff apartments here. That's the lower level um, unit we looked at that was added on, um, but again, approved at a similar time as the original version of this application was approved. So you can see it drops down. So essentially what you would have is, as I say, the, air, the land level sloping from North Orland Avenue, which would be over here, down to Cliff Promenade. So with the Red, Red Rift apartments sit approximately 28 metres above sea level at its highest point. So it's, this is its sort of frontage with North Orland Avenue. Um, the rear of the, and it's just over 23 metres above sea level at its boundary with the application site. So in this location here. Um, it's the rear of the elevation the proposed annex would sit within two metres of the boundary of the rear boundary of Red Rift apartments. But that's the actual garden area, not obviously not the block itself. Um, but they are, as I said, they are proposing to reduce the land levels down. So it drops down to the same level of where the houses are. So given this reduction and the fact that the rear elevation of Red Rift Apartments is set some 15 metres away from the rear boundary, it's not considered that the pro proposed annex would be overbearing or re um, result in loss of light or sense of enclosure to that development. It is acknowledged that there may be some loss of views, um, particularly potentially from this apartment here from to the sea, but that would be loss of views rather than a sense of enclosure or um, actual harmful residential amenities. And it, uh, the loss of use is not a planning consideration in the same way as overlooking or sense of enclosure or loss of light. So we do feel that there would be accept an acceptable relationship between um, the proposed development, including the annex and the occupiers of Red Riff, that it would not be um, sufficient to result in a reason for refusal. So just um, to conclude, members, um, there is no highway impact. Um, the design of the dwelling is striking and unusual, but um, it's felt that North Orland Avenue is the place to go a bit unique and a bit different. Um, and it does still use materials that are found in the local area and on the estate. So it is thought to be acceptable. Um, Sorry. They have paid the SAM, uh, put in the undertaking for the SAM contribution. So the officer recommendation is for approval, members. Thank you. Thank you. I move that the officer's recommendation is adopted. Can the vice chair please second? Seconded. Thank you. Do I have anyone who wants to speak? Councillor Moore. Yes, thank you, Chair. 
Um, so, could you just confirm two, a couple of points to me, please? The first one was uh, the original planning expired, and that's why it's being renewed. And secondly, the annex was an addition to the new proposal or the existing proposal. Thank you. Yeah, the, you're correct in it was granted originally planning consent. It's in the quite a lengthy section on planning history because I tried to sort of deal with the surrounding developments as well. It was granted consent in 2019, the same application we're considering now. So the dwelling and the annex and the so the scheme is before us now was granted consent in 2019 it's come back with the three year normal you've got to implement it within that time period of three years it wasn't implemented within that time so they've sought to resubmit and the annex was yeah could i come back to you so if if this was refused for example then when it was previously passed then the likelihood it would go to appeal and if so that would cost potentially cost us money if successful yes they could well appeal if we were to refuse it today yes um, but obviously i can't speak to the applicant's intentions councillor alban thank you chair yeah um question um was the site ever previously developed was there a, a house building on the site it looks like there might have been um i don't know if you know that or not was it okay we'll have none of that here uh, uh, so yeah there was a there was a there was a convent on the site uh, for those of you that have been around uh, a while you may recall the a large application came in for originally 13 and then 12 houses for the development of this area and also other areas in the north form of the state which the committee refused but then was approved on appeal which then resulted in lots of individual reserve matters applications to sort of set the principle of developing the site at that point okay um as is, as has been said by councillor moore you know we this we, we the council approved this same development in 2019 therefore we can't refuse it now you would just be stupid too and we will end up at appeal and we and we will get costs against so uh that's all i want to say thank you chair um i do remember the one when it sorry. came sorry. Sorry. sorry i was just waiting for sorry you. to jump just in for um so yeah i just wanted to confirm so i think it's just important to stress that the proposal is identical circumstances are, are not different in terms of the timing of when Redriff was granted consent which therefore is committed development so then obviously any subsequent decision that was made is made in the line of that Redriff's been approved uh, just to just absolutely point out a, a difference um, that obviously when it was approved previously it was under the old local plan and not under the new local plan in 2020 However, we don't consider that there's a policy change in terms of the quality of development. In terms of one of the changes that did occur, which is relevant and uh, addressed in the report, is that Broadstairs Neighbourhood Plan has subsequently been adopted. That includes um, the area of high townscape value policy. That was in the old local plan, but is not in the new local plan. So effectively, it's the same, it's the same policy basis to which both decisions are made. But there is a slight difference between the policy framework, which is addressed in the report. Thank you. Um, I'm just aware that the, uh, before I bring in Councillor Matterface, I'm just aware that the uh, gentleman who spoke uh, from Redriff at the beginning would like to speak again. Um, so I'm not able to bring you back in under the policies and the procedures of the committee. I'm sorry. Um, Councillor Matterface. I was just going to say, um, as Ian will remember, when it came forward in 2012, and it was refused on the grounds of correct me if I'm wrong, it was a very important habitat for certain moths, yeah. Um, but I do remember, I've asked you this before, um, we talked about Section 106 money when it was, the whole site was up for approval. So presumably that, does that still apply? Um, so the, f if, if there were some applications that came forward as part of the reserve matters application, so to the, to the outline, but what 
also happened is the individual plots were sold off and then bought by individuals. So when they developed their sites, they weren't effectively on the hook for the 106 on the original because they were different applications. Uh, what we did do for those that were developed, um, we have received Section 106 contributions towards affordable housing because that was one of the things that was put forward in terms of uh, making sure that came in. But that didn't apply to all 12 plots because all 12 plots, were, for one, haven't been developed and they weren't developed under that original application. Thank you. Councillor Alban. Yeah, sorry to come back, but I, just that um, Mr. Livingston come in with information after I spoke and then it, it went on. But I, I think what's important in within the report is that both Broadstairs Town Council and the Broadstairs Society do not have a problem or, or an issue with this. Thank you. Okay, if I don't have any more speakers, then uh, we will now put the motion for the officer's recommendation for approval to the vote. Um, those in favour? Thank you, that's carried. So the next item is uh, 32 Crow Hill Broadstairs. Speaking in favour of the application is Mr Lewis Duggan. Um, you have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. The proposed plans designed by myself, my partner, and Phil Dads, the architect, have also been passed by John Elvridge, planning consultancy, prior to being submitted, and he is confident we are not breaching any planning laws. I've based our speech as advised to address the objections in the report. If you have the report in front of you, it may help to follow down the objections which are bullet pointed so you know which objection I'm referring to. Firstly, the first objection is related to the Party Wall Act, which I understand is not a planning matter, and that will be addressed accordingly. The next objection state four rooms will have ne negative impact on loss of light, which is strictly not true. Rosemary Bullivant has been into number 34 and only, only deemed one room, which is currently used as a study, to be impacted slightly by the extension proposed. And as it is a study, it's currently not used as a habitable room. It also does not affect light enough, according to Rosemary, which is, she does state in her report. It's also noted that the rear of number 34 has additions to the original footprint. We are proposing to come out just shy from the line of their property, as you'll be able to see in the street plan. We both have side access of approximately three feet, so we're not putting an extension up directly in front of the study window. The next three bullet points all relate to what I've just said. Overshadowing has also been mentioned, which is not the case. We have a north-facing garden, and the sunlight that gets into the study window comes from the front of the pro property. Our permitted development rights allow us to build a two-storey extension and match the existing height of the roof, which we did not want to do because we're this will have more impact on the neighbours. Instead, we have considered them during the planning and design process and put a flat roof on the proposed extension. The window that is in question on the seventh bullet point is going to be a V-Lux window in the roof, which is over a bath, so the window is not going to reach any privacy to the neighbours. Number nine states the measuring function can't be used accurately on the, on the council website, which, is, which are, is not our fault. However, the designs are to scale, so it can be measured that way. Number 30 wanted to gauge how high the extension is going to be. And it's going to be 0.8 metres higher than the rear extension that's already on there, which is roughly three metres down from the existing bungalow. All windows and Velux windows will be installed according to building control specifications. No overlooking will be able to happen. Also, number 30 wants restrictions on any windows going down the side of our property. If we wanted additional windows there, there, we would go through planning. We wouldn't do anything we're not allowed to do. The driveway, which is of concern to number 30, will also, also will be installed with a permeable block so no water will drain into his property. And the reason for the additional driveway on the front is because I'm a builder with two vans and my partner has a car, so more spaces are needed. Also, we want to future-proof the house for when we have a family one day to keep more cars off the road. Lastly, Jill Bayford's reason, reasons for bringing this to committee are loss of light, highway safety, which I've just addressed, and also the concern for character. Character is one of the main reasons we bought the bungalow, and the rear extension will not be seen from the front street view at all. However, permitted development will change the front view as you will see the roof, which is why we have put in what we have. The only thing that's changing on the front is the driveway, which keeps, keeps in with most properties on Crow Hill, as mentioned in Rosemary's report. Thank you for listening, and we hope answering the objections will aid you in following the planning, planning officer's recommendation of approval. Thank you. Thank you. Speaking against the application, Ms. Steffi Egan. And I'll, I'll just remind you three minutes. Yeah. Um, in the um, response to, the, to my objections, it's actually riddled with inaccuracies, and unfortunately I can only have time for one. And I'd like to draw your attention to page 114, second paragraph, where the agent for Mr. Duggan 
who is also the architect for this, is claiming that whilst there may be some loss of light, I mean, as an architect, you should be able to prove how much light I'm going to lose. Um, and outlook from existing windows facing the site is considered the impact would not be significantly greater given the existing relationship of the application site to neighboring windows, and that is wrong. If you look at the current plan, the window in question, and whether I'm using it as a study, as a laundry room or whatever, I may have to use this as a future bedroom very soon. It is facing 32 Core Hill and is facing southeast. And if you, if any of the councillors had a chance to have a look at my additional evidence, which hopefully you might have seen in the meeting room, and thank you if you did. The, position, the property, my deed goes back to 1912, the bungalow was built later. And what has been taken into consider consideration was the Prescription Act of 1832 under Section 3, which is, gives, grants my, because my property had, ever since the bungalow and my house was built, uninterrupted light coming into that room. And whilst that is not leg legislation you need to take into consideration for planning, you have to, anything after, after building regulations comes in. From the center point of that window is a 45 degree angle of light coming into that room, <coughs> actually giving me uninterrupted sunlight for at least half a year until midday and not just the early morning. They're going to reduce this angle to 12 degrees of direct light coming into the room. Now also, if you ever saw the bungalow, you would have wondered why is the roof the size it is? Because it gives my property to the center of the window a 25 degree angle of overshadowing. That will be significantly increased the entire length of my property. So therefore, I'm claiming that this development has significant loss of light for me and therefore loss of outlook and therefore creating adverse overbearing and creating an adverse overbearing effect, creating an oppressive living environment for existing and future residents. Yes, in that one room. What is overbearing? It's not quantifiable. But you don't have to take my word for it. I did the measurements. I submitted to you last, last minute, I know, some diagrams. Please at least re reject this proposal and have a site visit so you can see for yourself what the impact of that extension will be to my property. Thank you. Thank you. I will now hand over to the Principal Planning Officer to outline the report. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is the application site outlined in red here, number 32, Crow Hill. Um, so Crow Hill, you can see, is here. Linden Avenue um, is uh, to the rear of the site. So this is an aerial view of the property. So number 32 is in this location here. And you can see another view of it here. So it's a chalet style bungalow with some accommodation already at first floor level. Um, you can see there's an existing rear projection into the garden um, and then some small um, extensions um, next to that. This is uh, the property of um, the, um, spe the speaker that's just spoken. Um, so this is the existing windows within her side elevation. So there's one at first floor level and two at or three at ground floor level. So you can see the existing ones at ground floor level here and there's another one um, in this location here which you'll see later on in the photographs. And this is the front of the property. So um, you can see that some excavation works have already been carried out to the front. So the demolition of the front boundary wall wouldn't require permission because it's not in a conservation area. Um, but the excavation works um, are, will require consent um, and they're proposing to um, use this space for, for parking provision for, for vehicles. And you can see the existing um, access to the side of the property. So the site runs up to the boundary on the right hand side here and you can see the fence on the left hand side here. Um, you can see within the existing front elevation there's an existing dormer at first floor level and you'll see later on the proposal is to change that window um, to French doors. So this is looking to the left hand side so this is um, number 34 Crow Hill you can see two story properties um, in a row of terraces and then to the right hand side number 30 Crow Hill um, which is also um, a, a bungalow with accommodation at first floor level. And then this is a view from the rear of the application property. Uh, this is also from the rear. So this is the application property on the right-hand side. So you can see this is an existing extension that projects out. So the proposal is to extend on the right-hand side up to that same um, rear elevation. So it won't project any further than um, this rear elevation that you can see. And then you can see the properties um, in Linden Avenue beyond. And then another view from above. So again, you can see the existing rear projection. So the proposal is to... 
um, sort of mimic that with a, a projection that comes out on the right-hand side here to the same depth, um, with the same um, matching height, although the height is increasing, which you'll see in the plans, and then um, the infilling of the space in between. Um, again, so the whole thing is squared off to create a single story extension that, that squares it off in line with the existing rear and side elevations of the building. Um, so now we're going to walk around the side elevation. So again, as you heard, the concerns were to do with the impacts on this neighbouring property. So we're going to walk around the, the side here. You can see the, na the neighbour's windows. So this is taken along that side view. So this is the neighbouring window um, that um, has, has raised concerns. And you can see there's a window first floor level above and then some um, windows beyond. Um, and then this is the application property on the right-hand side here. So there's a gap of 1.8 metres from the neighbouring elevation to the existing elevation of the existing property, and that gap will um, be maintained through the with the extension being added on. So a 1.8 metre gap will continue with the rear extension that's being added. And then this is taken inside the neighbouring property, looking towards the application property. So this is the existing um, side elevation of the neighbour. Um, you can see that this window does look partially onto their existing side wall. Um, so some of the concerns when addressed within the report is that there is already some loss of light and outlook already to this window from the fact it is facing onto the side elevation of the existing property. Um, but you can see the, the concern raised by the neighbour is that there's light and outlook um, at an angle from this window. So standing off to the right-hand side here, you would she would get some light and um, outlook at this point here and the extension is looking to extend into this space so this again just another view from that window looking towards the um, neighbors uh, so with the application property and the extension is going in this location here and then this is now in the rear garden of the neighbor so again the neighboring window is is here and you can see here these are secondary windows I believe because they're further to the rear so it's mainly this window that's raising the concern um, at first floor level there's um, an existing window but that's looking onto the existing um, roof of the applicant and this roof isn't changing in in height so again the app, the proposal is to extend into this location here and then this now is looking back onto number 30 um, there's um, a gap of 3.5 metres to um, this neighbouring property and um, it's not considered there. It's well, quite a large gap there. So this is now the block plan showing the extension. So whilst it's all coloured, um, this bit actually is existing and then it's squaring off in this location here. So looking at the elevations, this is the proposed front elevation with the existing dormer window. Um, and you can see with the original um, front boundary wall and um, and now that's showing that, that area excavated and the dormer changed into doors. So this actually isn't enlarging. Um, what's actually happening is just the um, sill is being dropped down, so it's not becoming a larger dormer if you were looking from a side view. It's just the fact that that's dropping down, so that's actually inside the roof slope with a glazed balustrade in area. Um, this is now the side facing the neighbour with concerns. So these are the existing windows within that um, side elevation and you can see the existing rear projections and this is the proposed so the main roof is remaining as existing um, the change is the the addition of this projection so it's um, five point it's five meters deep and it will be 5.5 meters to ridgeline level at, um, at that point there but you can see it's following through from the existing eaves and then you can see there's two VLUX windows within the existing roof. These are serving um, bathrooms. And again, they face onto the blank side elevation of the neighbour. So there's no concerns with the provision of these windows in the roof space. And on this side view, you can also see that front dormer as well. So again, you can see that the dormer is not enlarging. It's just the fact that they're digging down into the roof space. And then the um, balcony is being provided or the balcony area has been provided in the roof space. And then this is the other side elevation facing number 30 um, as existing and as proposed. So again, the only increase there is the, um, a slight increase in ridge height um, of 0.8 metres of this existing extension, but the actual depth of the extension remains as existing. And similarly, the VLUS windows were faced onto the existing roof slopes of the neighbour. So again, no overlooking concerns of these. And they also again serve um, bathroom and wardrobe areas, so um, are likely to um, be obscure glazed. 
and then this is the existing rear elevation and this is the proposed. So you can see the applicant has um, attempted to keep the height of the rear extension down. So this is a flat roof area at the back. So again, this is the, on the right hand side is the neighbor's window that's raising concern. Um, you can see that it's keeping the same eaves level and um, pitching away from the boundary up to this um, uh, flat roof area. Um, in terms of the additional windows, there's a V-Lux within that rear um, elevation that's just facing the garden, a three skylight windows within um, the flat roof and then bifold doors with a balcony within that rear elevation again facing into the um, existing garden. So ground, uh, ground floor plans, this is the existing ground floor plans so on the bottom left hand side is the existing rear projection and then you can see that there is where it's squaring off at ground floor level um, with a neighbouring window being in this location here at ground floor level. And then this is the existing proposed, uh, existing first floor plan, and this is the proposed with the um, bedroom being added um, at the rear with the bifold doors. And you can see to the front, that's where the French doors are being added to the existing dormer and the balcony. And sorry, also in here, you can see the VLUX windows. So the VLUX windows are serving these um, bathroom areas. So there's two in this location here, uh, one in this location here, and one here, which appears to be. Um, a wardrobe, walking wardrobe area. And then roof wise, this is the existing roof plan and this is the proposed, you could again see the flat roof element in between and the two areas pitching away from the neighbours. So the main concerns are the impact on the character of the area. So in terms of the actual um, front elevation, the only change is the, um, the windows to the doors. As you saw from the photos, there's a variety of different styles of property within the road. It's not considered that the change from a window window to a door would result in any, any significant visual impact from the from the area. So this uh, the impact from this this is considered to be acceptable. In terms of the actual excavation works, again, there's a number of properties that have parking in the area. As I mentioned, there's no it's not a conservation area, so the provision of this space is considered to be acceptable. They're proposing to pave it, so there would be drainage, permeable paving. Um, and highways have raised, uh, I've not commented because of it being a, a, a smaller household application, but there would be visibility displays from this space, and therefore the impact on highways from the provision of this for parking is, is considered to be acceptable. Um, and then in terms of the impact on neighbours, which is, is really the main um, consideration from from the neighbour's point of view, um, as you as you see from the sorry going back to the side elevation. So the side elevation that's facing the neighbour, there will be an impact to the lighting outlooks to this neighbour's neighbour's window. Um, but as you saw from the the photos, they there is already some impact because of the fact there is the existing building in this location. Um, it's very difficult to protect um, light and outlet to side facing windows because there's lots of PD rights that properties have. They could build uh, erect fences up to two metres on the boundary. Um, they could build a four metre deep extension to the rear without any planning permission. So they could already build that, not necessarily what's proposed because it's too high, but they could build a, um, a four metre deep extension without planning permission being quite required. And therefore it's very difficult for us to try and uh, refuse an application on the grounds that we consider an impact to a side facing window to be um, significant when there are those fallbacks um, that exist. Um, so given the fact that the applicant has, has attempted to reduce the impact as much as possible by keeping the ridge height down as, as low as possible, following the ease line and not bringing it any closer to the neighbour, um, and given the fact that there's already some partial loss of outlook and light anyway from this window, it is considered that on balance the impact is acceptable. Um, so in terms of the other neighbour, as you saw from the block plans, there's the, in, the slight increase um, in height of, of this by 0.8 metres, given that distance, is not going to impact any rear windows of, of this property. So the impact on that neighbour is considered to be acceptable. And in terms of to the rear, there's a distance of 25 metres from the proposed bifolding doors to the rear garden of the property in Linden Road. So again, there's no privacy concerns regarding, regarding that. So overall, it's recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you. I move that the officer's recommendation is adopted. Can the vice chair please second? Seconded. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Matterface, first, please. Um, if I could just ask Emma, there's a, 
Juliet Balcony at the back as well, looking, um, it's mentioned, it's there. Is there any concern about overlooking into Linden Avenue? Because it is actually very close to Linden Avenue in your original map. I just wonder if there have been any concern raised there about overlooking. Um, well, there's a, a distance of the 25 metres, um, I believe, from, from the rear elevation to the boundary. Um, I believe also that Linden Avenue, I think, is at a high ground level, I think, from visiting the site. So, um, given the distance and the change in level, we've not had any objections as far as I'm concerned from the residents in that location. Um, so, yeah, I think we consider the impact acceptable. Um, before I bring you in, Councillor Bofer, can I just ask you to use a different microphone? We have a minor technical problem with um, that one that you were using earlier. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask um, Councillor Garner to Councillor Garner to do the same if you speak again in the meeting. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I called this in because, in fairness, really, to to the residents of the area. Um, lots of light is a consideration. I'm concerned about the possible um, inaccuracy of the measurements. Um, and I totally agree with our lady speaker that, that she should be able to use her rooms however she wants to, however they're used currently. Um, I have to say, I think if ever there are a cause for a site visit, this is one, because I think we need to see properly how this would be affected and I really think that would be beneficial. Thank you. Councillor Moore. Yes, thank you Chair. I was wondering if Emma and Ian could explain to the rest of the members of the committee uh, the 45 degree rule and in, in reference to the fact that the objector has mentioned that that 45 degree rule has been affected and she's only got 12 degrees now just so that everyone's aware. And I also agree that that might, might require that we actually um, have a site visit. Thank you. Um, the 45 degree line um, a rule that we usually look at is more to rear windows. Um, so if you were extending out and the neighbour had a rear window, then we'd look at the 45 degree lo line from that window coming out. From side windows, it's very difficult because the the extension already hits 45 degree lines from her. I think what she men mentioned in her speech is that she has light coming in at a 45 degree angle into that room. Um, but because it's a, because it's a side facing wind window, it's very difficult for us to um, really protect the light from that side facing window. Even though it is a habitable room, we accept it is a habitable room because she's using it as a study. Um, but it's very difficult, like I mentioned, because of the fallback for PD that could impact on that anyway. But I think, if, yeah, if members feel that a site visit would be useful, then that is certainly something we could consider. Uh, and just to come back on a, a sort of distinction between loss of light, which is a material planning consideration, and, and the right to light. Obviously, the right to light, as, as mentioned by the speaker, is a sort of separately defined legal easement over land, which is governed by civil legislation, so it's separate. But the judgment for members is, is yet yeah, whether or not there is a loss of light that occurs as a result of this that harms the living conditions. Obviously, in our, in our view, um, because of the fact that the roof hips away uh, and the distance isn't changed of, of how close the property is, and, you know, not you know, taking into account, again, the, the use of that room is why we've considered it acceptable. Um, but just to clarify that there is a sort of distinction there, and we have had instances before, and again, sort of slightly harking back, but the site in Minster, which had a lot of controversy in a site visit where members approved the development but they could never build it because there was um, a, a, an injunction or similar sort of civil proceedings taken out because of a right to light over a side window specifically. So there is a separate element there. Thank you. Councillor Garner. Thank you. Using a different, more appropriate microphone. Um, <laughs> Good. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Firstly, I agree with Councillor Bayford on more or less everything she said. Um, and we, I certainly believe we could, we would benefit from a site visit here. So I am minded to um, vote to refuse this application to enable that to happen. Um, I would like a little bit of clarification about um, 
about permitted development and what could happen if we do um, if we do refuse this or what what they could do because I did read with with interest the email I, we all received I think from um, Mr. Dads about which sort of outlined the course of action that might be taken if we were to deign to refuse permission for this. So I would like a bit of clarification on why, in fact, this there, we are having this um, application. What what is the difference, please? What why 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 do we need it? I think we're just waiting for an officer to come back in. Just bear with us a moment. Um, so, permitted development rights for detached units, uh, detached dwellings, they can build out four metres from the original rear elevation, but there's a restriction on height. So, at the moment, this is proposing a 5.5 metre high um, extension, and that's too high. So, this couldn't be built under permitted development. Um, but, from, I believe it's four metres, just double checking, because there is a restriction where if you're two metres from the boundary, it changes, but just can't remember... Yeah, I believe it's four metres in height. So if it was dropped down one and a half metres, um, this is also a five metre deep extension. So basically, this is too deep and too tall. If it was reduced from five metres down to four metres in depth, and if it was reduced from 5.5 metres in height down to four metres in height, then it would be permitted development. OK, thank you very much. Councillor Wing. Uh, interestingly, the original design of the house put that... that the, 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 the extra bit going out on the side of the house where there was a driveway. So the original consideration of the design of the house would have been to have put a driveway between that, that bit that stuck out and the neighbour next door. So what we're proposing here is to, is to actually create, do that in effect. But it does seem to me that it's way too close to that, the boundary of the, of the house on the other side, which doesn't benefit from a driveway being in the way. So I would support we refuse this application and we need a site visit because I can't... Whatever way you look at it, from there, it seems as if this development will result in a, in a, in a raising, in a, in a lifting of the wall and then a roof that I, I grant goes away from the property but will still have quite a devastating impact looking at these plans uh, on that on the light into that room but i'd like to personally have a look anyone else um i yeah i'm going to bring uh, the officer back in so just to, just to confirm where we are, in terms of um, a number of people have expressed a wish for to visit the site. We haven't haven't quite hit the, uh, the the magic number in terms of the majority of members. Just to confirm, and the motion on the table is to approve. And just to be clear, you're you're voting about that motion. You're voting to refuse the application. It's just that that motion would fall. And then obviously, if anyone wanted to propose an alternative motion at that point, uh, then they could do so. Okay, if I don't have any more speakers, then um, we will put the motion to, um, for the officer's recommendation for approval to the vote. And if you want a site visit, you need to vote against. Um, that's the only way. So uh, can I have those in favour? And those against? The motion is lost. Uh, in that case, we need an alternative motion. Uh, would someone like to make a proposal? Uh, Councillor Bayford. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to propose a site visit, please. Thank you. And the second of that. Uh, I got Councillor Garner's hand first. So uh, just a reminder from the beginning of the meeting, the uh, visit, um, site visit will take place on the 7th of July. Sorry? Oh, I'm just being corrected here. We just need to vote on the motion for the site visit, please. <laughs> All those in favour? Uh, 
Anyone against? Three against. Okay. <laughs> the, it will be a site visit. That is that one's carried. Um, it's on the seventh of July, and it will be at nine thirty in the morning. Thank you. Now I'm conscious at this point that Councillor Rizeki, uh left the meeting um, at the beginning of this item. Um, I don't know where he is, but perhaps we could just oh, take him. Go we can get him back in. Thank you. Yeah, if if we just um, take a five minute comfort break while we find Councillor Oh Councillor Rizeki. if anyone wants it. Yeah, we'll just we'll just take five minutes.
Can, can we can we reform, please? <laughs> Councillor Matterface. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, so, next item on the agenda is land north of Down Barton Road, St Nicholas at Wade. And I have first speaking in favour of the application, Mr Dean Richards. You have three minutes. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Mr. Richards, and this is my wife and son, Sarah and George. Sarah and George, members of the planning committee, approved the house next door, and stated at the committee it was a sustainable location. The permission was granted for the glamping de development around my property, and when it was built higher than it should have been, it was approved retrospectively. Then it does not have enough housing supply. Despite what is said in the report, the Council has not met its duty to provide enough self-builds in the district. We have evidence to prove this. The house is lower than next door development and so there will not be landscape impacts. Our land is very important to us. As a family, we visit daily and often stay weekends in our shepherd's hut and have done so for the last several years so we'll create no extra village traffic. Our single storey dwelling would be located where our four shipping containers are and therefore would have no impact on wildlife. We have planted several trees since owning our land and kept clean and tidy. And we used to live in St Nicholas Village and fitted in with village life and church. Since owning our land, Mr Evans has built his house, his two barns, his glamping site, his log cabins surrounded us, impacted on our view. How can I have all that and me not be able to self-build our family home? Uh, family home. Uh, and his impact on our view. Um, if we sold to, to travellers, they would be allowed to live there, which would have a huge impact on village life. Finally, I'd like to thank Councillor Pugh and Sir Roger Gale for their support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Pugh. Thank you, Chair. Um, I called in this application to committee because I think it's important that not only do we have a variety of housing in the villages, but one of the main gripes that I have, and this is where I suppose there's always the challenge, particularly with the local plan and uh, and, and building on agricultural land, as has happened in, in a lot of the villages, is that there's, there's there never seems to be enough housing for people that want to have grown up in the village and want to stay and, and live in the village and, and then raise their families and, and everything. Um, there's a few things that I want to particularly touch on with this application, and I do apologise. My uh, laptop has decided to kind of freeze on me, so I can't really flick through um, the the report. But there's a few things that I want to touch on. The first one is that it's deemed uh, within the report that this is outside of the village confines. There's many things that are outside the village confines that get built on in the villages on a very frequent basis. Um, I know I'm probably one of, as a former ward member for Thanet Villages, I'm always a very strong proponent for protecting the village confines, but particularly the scale of this and the fact that it is one single dwelling uh, located next to, as um, Mr. Richard said, uh, uh, to uh, Huckleberry Farm. Um, I think it's, you know, it's really important that we provide that context, that you know, this is one dwelling uh, owned by a family that are very local and have, have owned this land for a number of years. Um, so I think it's important that that's, that's, that's um, understood. Um, one of the reasons that's been given uh, for ref uh, wanting to refuse permission to this is pressure on the special protection area. Um, I think it's important that members of the committee know that further down down Barton Road, right towards the end, is a large collection of, of farm buildings that are operated and owned by St Nicholas Court Farm. Um, particularly when it comes to you know the views and uh, of, the, of the open countryside, I would argue that they do look quite quite striking. None of them look particularly heritage or old in manner. They're huge, massive uh, metal steel construction. 
I'm not for one minute saying that they shouldn't be there. Um, it's farm buildings. They're there for a reason. But I think it's important that, you know, this is a one-story, a one three-bed, single dwelling. And to provide that context, it's not exactly going to stick out on the open landscape, particularly in that section of Down Barton Road. Finally, um, there was a part in the, in the report, and it may be uh, a misspelling, or it says that policy SP01 says that limited development um, is allocated in the villages and that it's primarily allocated to Moncton only, um, which I'm quite surprised about because we've just had the Tothill Street application come before this committee, a, well, a couple of hours ago. Um, you know, I th and, and again, I, I would like to emphasise that considering the size of this development and, and, and how sustainable uh, you can argue these smaller developments are, it's really important that we encourage measured development within the villages Otherwise, residents move away, um, there's no real connection to the local area, um, and that, that kind of community is, is lost. Um, this development is going to be largely self-contained, there's going to be parking on site. I appreciate that there's not going to be a footpath, sorry Chair, I'll just quickly wrap up, that there won't be a pavement to the site, but as I've already said previous, with other previous applications in St Nicholas, if that was uh, put to practice with a lot of other dwellings, half the homes in St Nicholas wouldn't be suitable, because normally you step straight out onto the road. Um, but therefore, I would like to urge the committee to, um, to grant permission to this application. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the Principal Planning Officer will now outline the report. Sorry, thank you, Chair. So this is the application site outlined in red. Um, reference has been made... Sorry, this is down Barton Road um, running across the bottom of the site. Reference <coughs> excuse me, has been made to the glamping site, which is located to the rear of the application site and around here. And there is also a dwelling that members approved some time ago in this location adjacent to the site here. So this is an aerial photograph of the site. So the application site is here. This is the site where the dwelling has been approved by members some time ago and the glamping site around it. But members will clearly see that there is um, sporadic development along down Barton Road, but it is very much a sort of agricultural environment and and as you obviously go further towards the village you've got summer road coming um, off there and then you're heading off towards the villages where the main sort of residential development kicks in but in the very surrounding area it is very much agricultural open countryside so we're looking <coughs> sorry up down Barton Road so um, the application site would be further down on your left-hand side, but that's the summer road coming off here, so you can see some houses there. Um, this is looking the other way, so the application site is now on your right, um, and the access to the application site is just about here where this um, structure is. Um, this is actually a view standing in the axis of the site are looking across to the opposite side of um, down Barton Road just showing the openness of the site so beyond the hedges it's again agricultural fields so this is the access gate to the site you can see it has been used it is an access but it isn't formalized it's not paved or you know it is more of an agricultural field access it has that feel to it so we're now, I'm now standing at the gate, as you can see the edge of the gate there, looking into the application site. So you can see there um, is a structure on the site and you are looking at, towards, you can just see um, the roofs of a, a glamping cabin on the adjoining site there. Again, this is looking into the application site, but looking the, opposite, the other way, so you can get a feel for the site. So there is some planting on the site that, appears to be conifer sort of planting there. Um, this is a view looking back towards the application site, so it's in this location there. This is an access which you can just see a sort of post there, but it's the access to the glamping site that runs um, around and there's access to the site here, to the glamping site, and you can see it as a, a, a glamping cabin there. And this is a view further away, so that's the same pole we saw there. And again, you can see the structures on the glamping site here. 
So this is the proposed site plan for the proposal. So the access road and gate would be formalised, so that would be paved, so you'd get a more traditional domestic access into the site. Um, the light green trees are existing. Yeah, so yeah, the light green trees you can see on this, or circles. I'm not too sure how it looks. Probably more circular are existing trees. The darker green ones are proposed trees. So there will be some additional planting. Um, and again, that this is a hedging we saw, and there is again the light green sort of hedging is existing. And there's a small area of additional hedging here but you can see the dwelling would sit in this location here and this would be its amenity space here with access and parking and there's a small shed shown here for cycle parking and general sort of uh, domestic use so this is the front elevation as proposed as has been mentioned it's single story in height and so that's the view that would be seen um, facing on to down Barton Road. This is the south, the side elevation facing east. So that's the site that would face uh, on to the sort of area where the existing dwelling that members approved some time ago sits. Um, this is the rear elevation. So that would face um, behind North Down Road onto the garden area. Um, and that's the side, uh, the west elevation, which would be facing out onto the open countryside. So as has been mentioned, it is a single storey dwelling. It has a footprint of some 140 square metres and a ridge height of 4.5 metres, as you can see there um, from the drawing. So you've got the main bedrooms, looking at the floor plan of it. Uh, the main bedrooms and bathrooms are situated in the eastern part of the dwelling. Uh, there's a terrace to the rear here and the main sort of living accommodation, sort of day-to-day -day living and dining area is in the western end of the <coughs> proposed dwelling. And you can see the large glazed areas of windows that we looked at here, uh, we looked at in the previous elevation. And that's just the roof plan of the site. Um, so in terms of sort of summarising members, it's not considered there would be any adverse um, impacts from the proposal on highways. Um, it is noticed there isn't a footpath, as has been mentioned by Councillor Pugh, um, to the village in this location. But members, when granting the... Um, dwelling on the adjoining site found that not to be an issue so we found it thought it unreasonable that we could add that as a reason for refusal um, to this application there's no adverse impact in terms of drainage ecology archaeology or the living conditions of surrounding occupiers um, or if there are any um, impacts they could be dealt with by conditions and it is considered that the dwelling itself would provide a good standard of accommodation for its future occupiers. Um, the main concern, however, is that whilst the dwelling would result in a contribution of a single dwelling, and that would contribute to the um, shortfall in the housing land supply, albeit a very small <laughs> contribution, it, it also has a benefit of... Um, being a self-built property where it's, there is an identified need for in the district and in the actual development of the single dwelling wood in itself provides some economic benefits during construction, employing people, etc. Um, so there are, is some weight to be given to the benefits of this development. But this needs to be weighed um, by members against um, the fact that the site is located in the countryside, it is outside the village confines, um, and it is within a land, uh, landscape character area which identifies um, open fields and farmland, and arable um, uh, land of that nature, and, and, and it's characterised for its openness and rural appearance. So the erection of a dwelling 
in this location would be visible in long views, uh, particularly from the west of the site and particularly where we saw those large glazed windows. Um, and it is considered to cause severe harm to the intris intrinsic character and beauty of the countryside and the landscape character area. So the recommendation is that it is contra contrary to the policies SP24, SP26 and QDO2 of the local plan. And this needs to be given sig significant weight when members weigh up the proposal. So the overall, the environmental harm is considered to outweigh the modest benefits that are, would be a, occurred from this grant um, being built out. And in addition, there is a technical reason for refusal that the applicants have failed to enter into uh, to mitigate against the pressure, provide an acceptable form of mitigation, sorry, to relieve the pressure on the SPA. So there is a technical reason for refusal, but it is acknowledged that that could be overcome by the submission of a unilateral undertaking to secure that contribution. But as it currently stands, the recommendation is for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. I move that the officer's recommendation is adopted. Can the vice chair please second? I second. Thank you. And who wants to speak? Firstly, Councillor Alban. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, severely detrimental? Don't think so. Um, not in my opinion. Um, the amount of work that was undertaken on the land to the side and to the back of this, this site by what is now called Gooseberry Farm or whatever it was. Um, there's been a load of development there. I don't know whether the person who owns that land lives there or not. I haven't got a clue. Um, whilst the actual design of the building is a bit left wanting, in my, in my opinion, as well, but... <coughs> For me, the small piece of land as it sits there with the Gooseberry Farm surrounding it, um, I think it's absolutely fine. I think the absolute use of that land is fine for there. Um, I'm sure as the, uh, in relation to the, uh, any legal agreement that's needed, I mean, obviously, we should we determine this for, for approval that that, that can be uh, obviously they we would put a condition in relation to that unilateral agreement that they must that must be in place and dealt with prior to any consent being being granted. But I don't see it as detrimental at all. I think that's the you know I could I would understand if it was further down, but in that part there, plus you've got one that's next door going to be built. I just can't see it's it's a problem. Thank you. Councillor Matterface. Thank you. Actually, Councillor Alban said a lot of what I was going to say. I was just going to ask the officer why the one next door, what had changed, that was approved in uh, May 2020. I know that was before the local plan was adopted. But um, was there any particular reason why that would have been permitted other than the local plan? And this one, you're recommending refusal? Uh, the, as in the site to the east, yeah. members refused it against, uh, sorry, approved it against officers of vice. It was approved, yes. That's my point. It was approved. I mean, it was done for refusal, hence the reference are um, reserved matters, but it was approved, although you recommended refusal, you're recommending refusal for this one, but that one next door within a few metres has got approval. Councillor Makinson. I was wondering what the finish on the house was. It's um, shown as stripes. It's obviously not brickwork. And what's the roof made of? Yeah, the details we've been given in terms, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of materials is composite roof material and essentially cladding to the walls. Not, I assume, boarding rather than, I'm, but I'm not sure if it's plastic or 
Wooden. Councillor Bayford. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with the comments made by Councillor Wooden and um, Councillor Matterface. I, I think the, um, the external finish is irrelevant. It's, very, very, uh, it's a single-storey dwelling. I really cannot see that this can be described as causing considerable harm. Um, and I feel that, even from, from the officer's report, the uh, benefits clearly outweigh the disadvantages. So I, I'm afraid I don't agree with the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Mazzecki. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I have to agree with my other councillors. Um, I don't see a problem with this, especially in the site that it's on. It's enclosed in that rectangle. Um, just evens out the site. Might as well go go where it uh, where where it's proposed. Um, I don't have an issue with it, and would be, I'm afraid, against the officer's recommendation. Councillor Wing. He's just used the dodgy mic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love the design because I think it, it, it's very barn-like, so it, it sort of fits in. It fits in the area, I, I, and I, I, you know, it's great to see that this will be, in a sense, an affordable build because it's going to be a self-build for a family that possibly couldn't afford to live in the village, sadly, or possibly any other part of Thanet at the minute. Uh, the only concern I would have, slight concern, is are we setting a precedent? Uh, we've approved one, we approved this one, does another bit of land come up? So that, that would be the only thing that would, no, would be giving me a little bit of a, a niggle. Uh, but, you know, I, I've a, a mind to support it because I think it's a good development. And Councillor Moore. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I've just for met the committee members, I think the actual external would be timber cladding or something, so that's going to weather in. And with the additional trees that were on the drawings being being planted, that's going to blend in even more. Uh, I'm in agreement with my fellow committee members that I think um, the officer's wrong in this case. Um, I think it's sustainable. I think it's well thought out. It is like an agricultural building in some ways, which will blend in in that landscape. Uh, so I cannot go with the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Okay, I think at that point um, we're getting a very similar message and I'm going to uh, put the motion for the officer's recommendation for refusal to the vote. Can I have those in favour of refusal, please? And those against? And that's uh, definitely lost. So we now need to uh, come up with an alternative motion, and I think uh, the officer is about to give us a draft. Thank you, Chair. Um, so members have clearly expressed that they consider that the benefits of the development outweigh the, any, any perceived harm to the countryside and character of the area. So the, the motion that we'd recommend in this instance, given that the motion has fallen, uh, would be to approve subject to the submission of an acceptable legal agreement securing the SAMS contribution. Um, and that would be approved on the basis uh, that the benefits of the development outweigh any harm to the character appearance of the area. Question, Chair. Could I uh, ask as well that um, if, the, uh, if the legal agreement is not entered into, this comes back to members, please? Um, so, if, yeah, if, well, if it doesn't come back to, well, if we don't get a legal agreement and the application just won't be determined, um, um, what we would do, usually do, and we'll come onto this with Park Lane later, is we'll put a six month expectation that comes in in that period of time. Can I just clarify something with regards to the motion? We did receive comments from consultees that you will have seen uh, and therefore um, I think it's prudent to potentially add safeguarding conditions related to what the consultees have, have requested on that basis and if members are happy to delegate that to officers on the basis that it will be approved subject to the legal agreement and safeguarding conditions to deal with those matters. Uh, I'll propose what uh, Mr Livingston has just said, Chair. Okay, I think Councillor Moore, I saw your hand go up first for the seconding, was that right? That's right, Chair. Okay, thank you. And can I have all those in favour of the motion? Thank you, that's carried. 
Okay, so the next item on the agenda is 16 Seoul Street Broadstairs. Uh, firstly, speaking under Council Rule 20.1 is Councillor Kevin Pressland. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members, for letting me have this opportunity to um, uh, relay my concerns about this development. Um, you'll see uh, on the plan that there is a, a drive coming in and parking areas there, and there is um, a proposal for five of the mature trees on that site to be removed because the RPAs will be compromised or a percentage of the RPAs will be compromised by the drive uh, and also the parking area. Um, but I, whilst I agree that there is clearly going to impact one of the trees particularly and that tree will, will go, there are the four other trees the percentage of the RPA could be actually retained by a system called a TERAM GeoCell 2020 tree root protection system, which is a per permeable 3D cellular so um, soil confinement system. And using this, this particular system, it actually safeguards the roots of the trees. So it doesn't go into the ground, but it just goes slightly above the ground with this cellular system, which has the, the, uh, a gravel and uh, a silt in between, which allows permeability and watering of the root system below. So this could safeguard those roots whilst allowing that development to take place. So my um, question to the, uh, to, to, to the members here is, is could the, there be amendment to the plan in the, and on the basis that that said type of system be used so that those four trees that could be retained uh, will be retained. And also to say that, you know, increasingly we're losing lots of mature trees in Thanet, and mature trees have a whole biodiverse habitat associated with them. And by just planting five other trees, as is proposed to the five trees lost, is not any, by any means, compensation for those lost trees um, and I'd just like to bring members to the attention that there is a professional methodology which has been produced by the Arboricultural Association um, uh, and um, uh, other professional bodies within that sector um, that Karen McKenzie, the tree warden of Broad says, actually has uh, details of which um, show actually the amount of trees that sh should be used to compensate to any degree the loss of those trees. So I, I, ask the, I, I urge the committee to ask for amendment of the application so the trees are retained and the proposed um, Teram Geocell system used as an, another sim, uh, or another similar product. Thank you for, um, thank you, cheers. Thank you. The principal planning officer will now outline the report. Sorry, Chair, actually, it's me. It's you. Um, so the application site is uh, in the centre of the screen. So this is a previous planning application that was considered uh, by members um, it's a couple of years ago now um, for Seoul Street and the erection of four dwellings on the site. Um, so the site has uh, a blanket uh, TPO on it. Uh, so it's an area order from 1974. Uh, and one of the key issues was what happens to the trees on the site uh, when we were agreeing to for it to be developed. Um, so this is a 3D which doesn't quite show the extent of the tree coverage that you have on the site when in bloom. So if we go down to street level on Seoul Street you can see uh, the trees at the front of the site. Um, so these trees are all being retained and these are covered by the TPO from 1974. So this is one view and then this is uh, just a view looking the other way. Um, then this is at the rear of the site at Crawford Road, uh, looking towards the trees. So the trees that uh, we were just looking at uh, are in this area here. There is a, a large tree, which we'll see in a minute, um, which is adjacent to the neighbouring property, um, which is, is also proposed now to be retained as well. Uh, and then this is a bit of a view further back. So the trees that... Um, were sort of the submission that we got in with the planning application which showed the trees uh, in the arbor cultural um, survey that was done identified uh, 
every tree on the site pretty much as a, as a C grade tree with a, 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 the, the odd B and some some U trees. So when they're grading that, that basically means it's the num the amount of years that they've got left, as well as the immunity value and the actual um, the health of the tree itself from from the observed survey that was done. Um, now. With the trees that I just want to draw your attention to, uh, members, um, specifically the trees that are affected by this proposal uh, is uh, 1C, which is uh, where my mouse is, is going around there. It's uh, 7C and 8C, so it's these two trees here. Uh, and then it's uh, 15U, uh, which is here. So previously, this proposed uh, this application was proposing to remove five of the trees that were previously safeguarded, and that was the big tree that we saw, which is um, 16B. That's now uh, to be retained. So the proposal is to remove uh, the trees that are, the spread of which is provided in red. Uh, the rationale that's been provided relates to. Um, when the further survey work's been done for the arbicultural method statement, which has to be submitted as one of the conditions on the original approval, um, the chartered ar arboriculturalist uh, has indicated that those trees, in his view, cannot, um, cannot be retained in their current positions, uh, but all the other trees that are outlined in the dotted black lines are still to be retained. Um, now, this is, um, I suppose, slightly unique in one sense that the application was approved on the grounds of that the there should be adherence to the plans, and there was a plan that said, you know, here are the trees that should be retained. These trees uh, that are to be removed are not considered to be covered by the TPO from 1974. They're not old enough, uh, and therefore, um, technically, they could have been removed before any proposal without consent. However, the condition was put on to ensure that you know all the trees are retained, and so the debate in particular with regards to the trees, is whether or not the loss of these trees is considered to result in harm to the character and appearance of the area uh, and, the, you know, and the immunity that's offered by these specific trees. And that has to be weighed against, obviously, the fact that this would be a reason for refusal, of effectively refusing four houses on the basis of these four trees. Now, in terms of um, the detail then, just to zoom in a little bit closer, um, you can see that, the, again, the spread of the trees, again, the, the, the Chartered Arboriculturist report um, indicates that the tree that's got the largest spread that was set behind that tree, so you, you can, can't see it from the road, um, is, is, a, is a category U tree, so it's not expected to, to live for more than 10 years from this point. And then the other trees are obviously relatively small in terms of their, um, their, their span in comparison with the trees at the front. So in our view, those trees can be removed without harming the character and appearance of the area. Uh, the other change that is occurring as part of the application is that one of the other conditions required um, adherence to this plan, which shows the uh, section and the land levels of the dwellings themselves. Um, just to give you some context, the, the, the building that's on the left-hand side is the neighbouring property. Um, if I go back to this plan, you can actually see that that dwelling is set quite significantly further back, uh, sorry, so further forward, uh, right on the road, uh, with the dwelling being set behind. It was considered that the distance is sufficient between the side elevation of Unit 4 and the rear uh, extent of, of the neighbouring property number 16. Um, but what's changing here is um, the land level is changing to ensure that the drainage would work within the dwelling, uh, and it's increasing in height by 22 centimetres, 22.5 centimetres. So that is included within the proposal as well. Um, so overall, it's considered that we don't consider that the, the, that the work that would be carried out would harm the character and appearance of the area um, significantly to warrant refusal of the application, given that the proposal would obviously you know, continue to provide the retention of the uh, trees that provide the significant amenity value on the site, as well as the provision of, of four dwellings, uh, and therefore it's recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I move that the officer's recommendation is adopted. Can the vice chair please second? Seconded. Thank you. Do I have any speakers? Uh, I will start with Councillor Garner. And Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, I called the original application in to be discussed by the planning committee. Um, it was while we were um, having meetings online. So I, I looked at it today, because um, just to remind myself, we were, we were all I called him because I was concerned about the loss of trees. Those of us who spoke in the 
in the debate on that application expressed their concern about the loss of trees. And the reason we approved the application unanimously, we all approved, including me, was because we got an assurance that these four houses could be built and the trees, all the trees on the site, could be retained. Um, these trees all um, have a, play a significant have a significant impact on the character of that area. I mean, I will say there is a tree at right at the bottom of South Street that was removed a couple of weeks ago for, for various reasons, with permission. But as these, as Councillor Presland has indicated, as these trees um, are lost, the biodiversity is severely affected. Now, this applicant assured us they could build these four houses without losing any trees at all. Now, they've come back now and said, we can't build the four houses without losing any trees, and we want to lose these four trees. Now, we've heard from Councillor President that there are ways of doing this without losing these trees, and they should be um, investigated. Or, if they can't build four houses without losing any of the trees, then maybe they need to reconsider um, the number of houses and the size of the houses that they put on that plot. But I think it is imperative that we stand firm and say no trees should be lost on this plot, as we did previously. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm happy to listen to others to be persuaded otherwise, but as it stands, I will be voting to refuse this application. OK, Councillor Keane. Thank you. Can the officers comment on Councillor Pressland's suggestions for the trees? Is that viable? I can't comment on it. It's not under consideration. It's the removal of the trees and whether or not that is a sufficient reason for refusal. Obviously, we have the report which is on the, on the website, which is submitted by the applicant, giving the, the Chartered Arboriculturalist view on, on the retention of the trees and why they, in the view of, of the applicant, can't be retained. But it is a, it's a it's a straight merits decision as to whether or not this would warrant refusal of the application. Councillor Moore. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I take it that the arboreal report was obviously paid by the applicant to have done, so that lends itself that I think that sometimes that's weighted towards the applicant. Um, and I agree with Councillor Garner's views that we agreed this unanimously on the basis that all the trees would be saved, and therefore the applicant needs to look into ways to do that to get what he wants. And, and I agree with Councillor Garnett. If he can't do that, then he either needs to reduce what he's doing or reduce the size. So I've, I would not be in favour of approving this. Thank you. I just want to come back on, on that. Um, when professional reports are obviously instructed by applicants, I think it's really important to distinguish between when you have, in this instance, someone that is a chartered member of the Arbicultural Association that's preparing a report, they are required to adhere to certain codes of conduct in terms of recommendations or not. And so I think in terms of the weight that's given to what the applicant's submission is, that is obviously something that is quite relevant. Um, in terms of um, the uh, principle behind um, the retention of trees at all costs, I remind that these trees are not protected under the TPO. Uh, they were originally... Uh, considered that obviously with all of the trees that the applicant put forward the fact that they were looking to retain them all. Um, they have obviously put in the application rather than for, you know, call, you know, having anything happen on site or anything like that. I do think it's important that the, the merits of the overall application have to be taken into account when determining this. We have all of the protected trees being, being retained and the provision of four dwellings on a site in the urban confines when we have a need for housing as identified by the lack of five-year supply. So I just need to stress that. Thank you. You want to come back in, Councillor Moore? Yes, please. Yeah, um, so if he's a chartered arboreless then, would he also have the knowledge that was brought to the table this evening about these other methods? And if he is, uh, I'd say, treat hugger, or, you know, as we call them sometimes, um, surely he would have those, those propositions to put forward to people, like the clients, to say there are ways of doing this. Um, and I don't think that's been done, so I think that might, that might need to be looked at. Councillor Matterface. 
take a slightly different approach. Um, one of the objections says there's no pavement on the side of the road. Now, these are four presumably quite large houses. I know Seoul Street very well, having walked my children to school for many years along it. It's a very narrow road, and my concern, I know I was obviously I wasn't involved when you approved it, is actually traffic coming out into that narrow road, but I appreciate we're actually looking at a slightly different aspect, but I am quite concerned about four big houses on there. Although, yes, you're going to tell me it's not relevant at the minute, but it is relevant to people who walk along that road during the day, at school time particularly. Yeah, uh, you're quite right. I'm going to tell you it's it's been con it was considered in the original outline application. It was considered in the original application when it was approved. We're only looking at the change, the the two changes, the loss of the trees and the change to plot uh, unit four in terms of that um, that land level. Councillor Wing, uh, I, 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 why are the trees going? What is the reason that the developer promised in the previous uh, application? Uh, that he could save all the trees or they could save all the trees and now suddenly something's happened and they can no longer save those trees. They could shrink the size of the houses and we'd still get four properties uh, to help our housing shortage. The other thing I'd like to add is I think the system that, that Councillor uh, Pressland is talking about was used by KCC to save the tree uh, near Ellington School. It's a cherry tree that's been there a number of years, the only tree that offers kids and parents shade in the summer. It's on the corner, cars park on top of it, so it, and it's proved, I think it's been done two years now, the tree's been okay, the area's been okay. So I certainly think we need to, if, if, if the builder's saying he's now got to cut these trees down, we need to understand why he can't keep them and whether he's explored the alternatives to trying to keep those trees and whether new technologies can be used. Um, so, so I've zoomed in here. It, it relates to the the hard surfacing for the access to for the parking of the dwellings. So the dwellings themselves, it's not an issue with regards to say foundations affecting uh, uh, RPAs or anything like that. It's it's in relation to where the parking access is. Obviously, the aim here is to try and get. You've got the visitor parking that's on site as well. Um, obviously, again, it, it leads to, links actually to the fact of what Councillor Matterface was saying in terms of parking off off any potential off off the road, which is why there's a visitor lay-by that you can see is obviously causing an impact on the tree to the the, the very north of that picture uh, that's in red. Um, so that that is the the view that's been put forward by the applicant and um, with regards to trees that that need to be removed as part of that plan by the uh, the arbor, you know, the arboriculturist. As I say, I can't speak to the um, um, you know the the potential method uh, that could be used there. Um, as I say, thanks. I've still got two more to speak. Councillor Alburn first. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm. Um, the easiest thing is to approve this application, isn't it? Um, but I, like my fellow councillors here, um, when the application was first being considered. The applicant was quite happy for those trees to be retained. And what is the difference between then and now? And the answer to that is nothing. Nothing is different between then and now because the roadway was going to go in anyway. So they knew about the, the roadway, the parking and everything like that. And, there was, and they were quite happy to leave those four, four trees there. So um, I'm, I have to say that... Um, I'm not in agreement with this. Thank you. Sorry, just to come back in on what's changed. The arbicultural method statement that members required as part of the approval, it was a condition saying you've got to submit a method statement. They've done the method statement to look at being able to protect all those trees, and in their view, they can't protect all those trees on, the, on that basis. In terms of the point about um, what was put forward, again, I, I keep coming come back to the point about the merits of this. I appreciate that members have been told all the trees they're looking to retain all the trees. But it's still got to be a judgment that's not based on what was promised, but actually what's in front of members. And what's in front of members is a proposal that is actually for, you know, whether or not that 
actually those four trees, specifically the quality of those four trees, the visibility of those four trees, and the removal of those four trees, uh, would actually result in a reason for refusal that outweighs four dwellings on the site. I just think, I, I'm sorry to keep stressing it, but it is really important that members do consider the weight on that. Um, Councillor President cannot talk to Councillor Gardner. Uh, excuse me. Um, I've got Councillor Bayford next, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm very torn here because I am concerned about the potential loss of four new homes. But I do accept the what other members have said, oh, and it, it does, does seem that the only, the only way um, that these trees are going to be retained is to, for us to refuse it tonight and for the applicant to come back with a new application. Is there no other option here? Um, if... Um I, I do not know in terms of the discussion between the officer and the applicant um, because obviously we looked at it again on the merits of the case. Um, if members weren't going to vote up to approve it and that motion falls, um, then a member could propose a motion to say defer to officers to seek um, you know, f further negotiation with the applicant around whether or not any of the trees could be retained with alternative measures being used um, you know, to, to what um, Councillor President was mentioning. Um, so we could seek that uh, rather than refuse it outright on the value judgment. Obviously, again, that does come with an element of risk because as we had with the, the, the application at Stone Road, there is obviously the ability of an applicant to, to appeal non-determination uh, against the council. Um, obviously, we would look to seek to resolve and provide what members are clearly expressing that they would want to see as much work done as possible to make sure that these trees are retained. Um, but that, that is the decision for, for members as to whether or not um, that is an option. But it does, it does come with an element of risk. I have to outline that as well. Councillor Ratigan. Um, and you're saying the trees are, are not protected. So basically the landowner could just chop, chop, them, chop, chop them down um, and any, anyway. Um, is, am I correct? Well, not quite, because it's part of a planning condition. If they were to remove them as part of developing the site, it would be a breach of the planning condition. In the event of that they didn't develop the site, the planning permission lapsed, say, um, they could remove the trees and then come in with an application for you know, the development again without those trees being there. Uh, but obviously, as it's a condition on the approval, it links to the development itself. Councillor Wing. I mean, looking at the, uh, you, you mentioned hard standing, so I mean, straight away, the jiggling of the parking below could move up to save that one tree. And I also noticed that, it, that if you look at unit one, the line from the boundary to the fence is, I think it's 10.1 metres, and then 10.8 metres. So, I, I mean, if there was a rejigging of those buildings on that site to maybe create some of the garden space in, in front of the buildings and behind the buildings, like we often see in a bit of a creative uh, way, uh, maybe maybe more of those trees could be saved. So, uh, you know, I think they need to go away and they need to look at that hard standing and see if they can rejig or move the buildings about uh, or reduce the size of the, 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 the size of the gar the length of the garden at the back and create some more at the front. I don't know, but you know they said they'd save them and they've come back and said they can't. It's not, I'm not happy. Okay, I think we will move to the vote. Um, so to put the motion for the officer's recommendation for approval. How many in favour of approval? And against? And abstentions? Then it's fallen. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, obviously, as we've discussed, um, in, in, the, in the fact that the motion has fallen, uh, officers recommend that it's deferred to officers to seek uh, alternative measures and or changes to the layout to seek the retention of the trees um, and then to bring that back to members. Um. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't have to say a word there, did I? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not. 
I'm not necessarily going to um, object to that, but I would like to emphasise, and I think I hope that we would like to emphasise, that the, any solution that comes back, any application that comes back, needs to z see zero loss of any trees. Thank you. Um, I think what, we'll look, what we will have to do is obviously find out for the applicant. Fundamentally, the decision-making uh, authority is with members. Okay, so officers can't. We can return it to you with not you know with uh, three trees removed and one, and you can make a decision on the basis of that. Uh, what we will do is we will see if we can conclude discussions, and we will bring you back what we've been able to get, and then you will be able to make a decision on that. So the motion is to um, defer and bring back. I have a proposer and a seconder for that. Um, anyone who wants to vote in favour? That's carried, thank you. So that concludes the public speaking for this meeting. I will now call upon the clerk to read out the remaining planning applications. If any member wishes to reserve an application, will they please call out as the clerk reads? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So uh, we have A01, land on the southeast side of Manston Road, Manston Airport, Northern Grass, Margate. We have A06, land adjacent to Harbour Master's Office and Public Toilets, Harbour Street, Broadstairs. We have A07, which is also land adjacent to Harbour Master's Office and Public Toilets, Harbour Street, Broadstairs. We have A08, Victoria Gardens, Victoria Parade, Broadstairs. A09, Margate Clock Tower, Marine Drive, Margate. A10, 8, Pluckley Gardens, Margate. A11, Flat 1, 189, High Street, Broadstairs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I have a proposer to move that the applications that have not been reserved be determined in accordance with the officer's recommendations? Councillor Alburn and seconder, Councillor Rizeki. Do members agree? agree? Thank you. Okay, one abstain. Um, for the... Yeah. For the, <laughs> for the benefit of the public, I will call upon the clerk to read out the applications that have been determined. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So the applications that have been re uh, determined are A05, land on the southeast side of Manston Road, Manston Airport, Northern Grass, Margate. A06, land adjacent to Harbour Master's Office and Public Toilets, Harbour Street, Broadstairs. A07, land adjacent to Harbour Master's Office and Public Toilets, Harbour Street, Broadstairs. A08, Victoria Gardens, uh, Victoria Parade, Broadstairs. A09, Margate Clock Tower, Marine Drive, Margate. A10, 8 Pluckley Gardens, Margate. And A11, Flat 1, 189 High Street, Ramsgate. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you. That's it? Agenda item five. Oh, agenda item five. Sorry. I've lost, I've lost a piece of paper. We have an agenda item five. Hold on a minute. There you go. Oh, I'm getting another copy. There you go. My apologies. Um, speaking under Council Rule 20.1 is Councillor Rhys Pugh. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry. I, I, I want us all to go home as much as you do. Don't worry. I'll be very quick. Very quick. But if you, look, if you go the way I want, then I'll be even quicker. Um, I, I'm speaking here tonight uh, mainly because uh, the Chair of Birchland Parish Council's Planning Committee um, was unable to speak on, on this plan application. So I have a bit of a statement uh, that I'm just going to quickly read out. Um, Robert Wright, Chair of the Parish Council's Planning Committee was not at the original meeting considering this application. Uh, he was on sick leave. He has since looked at the amended plan for six dwellings and would still agree with the original Council's comments of overdevelopment of the site and inadequate parking provision. Had the site's surface area been 1.5 larger than it actually is, 
there would be no reason to refuse, but as it stands, it is overbearing in both height and footprint, especially uh, to neighbours' properties. The second reason to refuse this application is the lack of parking provision. Park Lane is crowded enough already. Six properties equals uh, a minimum of six cars, and the suggestion in the supporting comments that one can easily walk into the village is great if one goes to the shops, but it does not, does not address the problem of where the potential 13 occupants of this development will work. Although this development is aimed at first-time buyers and older retired people, it is a fallacy to think that these people would not want to be owning a car. Young people these days, maybe myself included, want to own a car as soon as possible. There are at present nine six formers attending Cuthbert School who regularly park um, across the road from Canterbury Road in Queen Burpus Avenue, as an example. Uh, Robert Wright has also noted that in the published comments that one person objected to the application um, and on the 12th of April as published, but by the 16th she was all in favour. Was there coercion involved in this? Again, members, these are not my comments. I'm just sharing them. Um, therefore, uh, on behalf of Burston Parish Council, I would like to urge you to refuse permission on this application. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hand to the planning officer to outline the report. Thanks. Um, so the application site is outlined in red. So this was an application for six flats on 15 Park Lane. It came before members last year in July. Uh, members uh, resulted to defer the application for approval subject to the receipt of a legal agreement securing the SAMS contribution with conditions, and that had to occur within six months. Uh, we didn't receive that legal agreement within six months, uh, and we have now received the legal agreement which secures the contribution. But because the deadline has passed, we bring it back to members. And the reason why we bring it back to members is in case uh, policy has changed or national policy has changed. Um, since uh, July 2022, uh, no new policy has been adopted by the Council, no changes to the MPPF which affect or alter uh, this application in terms of requiring a redetermination of any material planning considerations of the matter. Um, and therefore, um, it's recommended for approval as no matters have changed resulting in the need for a new assessment by the committee. Uh, so it's down for approval. I move... Oh. Oh, sorry, I'm ahead, I'm ahead of myself. No? Yeah. Uh, well, no, I'm not. You can move, move the motion. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> A little confusion there. It's getting late. Um, I move that the officer's recommendation for approval is adopted. Can the vice chair please second? Second. Anyone want to speak? In that case, we will now put the motion for the officer's recommendation for approval to the vote. All in favour? That's carried, thank you. In which case, that does conclude the business for the meeting. Thank you for your attendance and good night. <laughs>